Good afternoon. And thank you for coming and welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm Carla Hayden, the 14th Librarian of Congress. And we're looking. Thank you. And we're looking forward to a very, very exciting afternoon celebrating the 50th anniversary of the signing by President Lyndon Johnson of the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967. And we have four star-studded panels in store for you, featuring many great names of public broadcasting, both in radio, on radio, and in television. And I want to take this opportunity to single out one of our guests here today. His name is Mr. Henry Morgenthau III. And he said I could tell you this. He is 100 years old. And he was working at WGBH 50 years ago when the act was passed. And his grandfather was Henry Morgenthau Jr., who was FDR's Treasury Secretary. And I am proud to say that the Library of Congress has the papers of his grandfather. And so, sir, we are truly honored that you are here with us today. Thank you. Many of you may know that the Library of Congress, as the largest and most comprehensive collection of motion pictures, television programs, radio broadcasts, and sound recordings in the world, is honored to host this event with WGBH Educational Foundation, our collaborators in the American Archive of Public Broadcasting, or AAPB. The library received its first public television programs in and at the Library of Congress, I get my centuries mixed up. <laughs> 1964, from the precursor to PBS, the National Educational Television and Radio Center. And incidentally, just last month, we digitized two of these programs so that they could be more accessible via the library's website. Now, the library's public broadcasting holdings have grown exponentially since 1964 to include tens of thousands of film, video, and audio masters from NET, PBS, NPR, WNET, and WETA. And in addition to the thousands of access copies we routinely, we routine, routinely acquire as copyright deposits from public broadcasting stations and producers across the nation. And as the chief steward of America's and the world's record of knowledge, we took to heart the television and video preservation study commissioned 20 years ago by the Library of Congress, which characterized public television as, quote, the richest audiovisual source of cultural history in the United States. And so we are proud to join with WGBH to ensure that public television's legacy <coughs> survives for future generations. Now at this time, I'd like to make some news, and that's why I'm kind of excited. I want to announce some exciting new acquisitions and projects related to public broadcasting preservation. First of all, and as a librarian, you don't get to break news that often, <laughs> so. You news people, bear with me. I want to thank Mr. Dick Cavett for donating to the library his collection. Oh, I heard a little oh, something go. Oh, oh. Mr. Dick Cavett for donating to the Library of Congress his collection of approximately 2,500 shows from 1968 to 1996, including the 1,000 shows he made for PBS. He interviewed more than 5,000 guests for these shows. And the list is astonishing and a testament to his ability to draw people not normally seen on late night television. Katherine Hepburn, Alfred Hitchcock, Angela Davis, Marlon Brando, and on one of the more memorable and notorious shows, 
Gore Vidal and Norman Mailer. <laughs> and he also featured rock and roll musicians to a degree pretty unusual for the time, including John Lennon and Yoko Ono, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, David Bowie, Judy Collins, and Joni Mitchell. So I was pretty excited to announce also that today the AAPB will launch an amazing new exhibit on its website that will make public television's first coverage of the Senate Watergate hearings available. I'm breaking news all over. <laughs> television's full coverage of the Senate Watergate hearings available online for the very first time. This was one of the <laughs> This was one of the most popular series in public broadcasting history. And the Library of Congress has digitized all of the master videotapes of the coverage we received from WETA in 1989 and with their permission are making them accessible online to anyone in the United States. The broadcast created what Dick Cavett has called Watergate junkies <laughs> to refer to himself and others who watched the hearings obsessively. The exhibit was created this summer by a Library of Congress junior fellow, Amanda Rikebeck, a major, a history major from Yale who is with us today. Could you please stand up, Amanda? Where is she? There's Amanda. We sent the detailed background essay she wrote to Jim Lair, who anchored the coverage with Robert McNeil. Jim also is here today, and after reading the essay, he wrote back, it is as terrific as it is accurate. And two years after hearings, McNeil and Lair worked together again on another landmark public broadcasting program. I think you've all heard of it and the rest of it, as they say, is history. Jim has commented that without Watergate, quote, there would have been no anything called McNeil Lanner. Later, Jim will be on a panel later today and will show a few clips from the Watergate coverage. AAPB also is in the process of making available online full interviews conducted for a number of landmark PBS series. Ken Burns's the Civil War, Eyes on the Prize, and the definitive series on the Civil Rights Movement, Eyes on the Prize, and the American Masters biography series and American Experience. So they are telling me to get off the stage because there is so much more I could tell you about the project, but I've run out of time. So I want to thank Ms. Patricia Harrison, President and CEO of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, for their support of the Library of Congress. Unfortunately, we're learning that Pat's flight has been delayed and she won't be able to join us this afternoon, but could you please give her a hand in absentia? And I'd like to introduce Leticia King, Senior Vice President of Communications for CPB, to speak on her behalf. Thank you, Dr. Hayden, and thank you for your leadership and also for hosting this important gathering at the Library of Congress. I would like to recognize Senator Markey and thank him for his important support, not only for his hometown station, WGBH, but also for his leadership advocating for and helping to sustain a vital public media system for all Americans. It is largely because of his and others' consistent support of public media that we are here today celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Public Broadcasting Act. The 1967 Act articulates a vision of a strong public media service providing access to every American 
to the highest quality of educational and informational content for free and commercial free. The goal then, as is now, to strengthen our civil society through content that would result in educated, informed, and engaged citizens, the three pillars of a vibrant democracy. From 1967 to 2017, the Act continues to provide us with an evergreen mission and vision for public media's important role in American life, and one that the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, CPB, is proud to advance. Because the Act created CPB and designated us as the steward of the federal appropriation, tasking us with ensuring these funds went to public media stations to serve underserved and unserved communities, from our youngest to our oldest citizens. We are directed to utilize technology and innovative ways of connecting to new generations to serve as America's largest classroom, to help inspire lifelong learning, and to invest in journalism that is fact-based, in-depth, and committed to editorial integrity. Today, PBS, NPR, and nearly 1,500 local public television and radio stations in rural, small town and urban communities across the country are fulfilling the mission and vision of the Public Broadcasting Act. Reaching 99% of an increasingly diverse America with content that continues to be of value long after the initial broadcast or digital presentation. Content that has cultural and historical relevance provides us with insights about the way we were and about the way we are now as a people as a civil society, as a democracy. The value of this content is priceless, but it was deteriorating and would no longer be accessible to future generations. That is why, following a two-year pilot that began in 2009, CPB provided almost $3 million in grants to, in 2011 to public media stations so they could inventory and protect their station archives. That first step helped to build the foundation for the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. But CPB did not do this alone, and we are appreciative of WGBH, the Library of Congress, and many others for their ongoing commitment to this important initiative. So in addition to thanking Dr. Hayden and Senator Markey, I want to thank John Abbott, the President and CEO of WGBH for his leadership. WGBH is an innovative, community-focused station providing public broadcasting for New England and is also PBS's leading content provider, producer, and a major supplier of programming for public radio and digital content nationwide. John's leadership has resulted in a strong partnership with the Library of Congress to preserve public media's legacy content through the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. And we are so appreciative of his commitment. Please welcome John Abbott. What a gathering. Oh, what an honor to be with so many of these extraordinary leaders through the history of public broadcasting. Thank you, Tish. Uh, let me add my welcome to all of you who've joined us today for this extraordinary meeting, this opportunity to share these panels and these reflections this history, and my special thanks to Dr. Hayden for hosting us. The Library of Congress is a fitting location to mark this milestone for public media. As many of you know, WGBH and the library came together, as Tish mentioned, four years ago to form the American Archive of Public Broadcasting to collect the significant historical content created by public television and radio stations over these 50 years. Because of the vision and support of Pat Harrison, CPB, and its board, the American Archive is preserving the programs that witness our collective history and tell America's stories. More than 100 public television and radio stations across the country, from Maine to Guam, have shared their content with the Archive. The collection now has over 50,000 hours of content, and we are adding 25,000 hours every year. And in keeping with the mission of public media, the American Archive is available directly to the public with some 23,000 programs, in addition to resources available daily for educators and researchers. 
WGBH is proud to be working in partnership with the Library of Congress to preserve these historic treasures and to make them available for future generations. And I'd like to acknowledge our dedicated American Archive team, Sue Kantrowitz, Karen Cariani, and Casey Davis of Kaufman. And on this anniversary, as we celebrate the legislation that created public broadcasting, we note with gratitude the federal government's investment in our work, consistent, persistent, and forward-looking. For WGBH, one individual in particular, of course, embodies that support, and that is our Senator, Edward Markey. Now, he had very much hoped to be with us today, and we're sorry he couldn't join us. He has served on the Advisory Council for the American Archive and has served on the Hill for 40 of the public broadcasting, of public broadcasting's 50 years. He knows our work very well. And throughout, he has been a stalwart champion of all that we aspire to do for the American people across the country. Our thanks to all of you for being with us here today. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from our extraordinary group of panelists assembled for this occasion. So I'll turn this back to our host, Dr. Carla Hayden, who may squeeze in a few more releases of new information. <laughs> Seems like she, her list, she only got halfway through her list, I think, which is very exciting. Uh, Dr. Carla Hayden, to begin our proceedings, and thank you again to the Library of Congress. Hello, everybody. Unfortunately, Carla had to leave, so it's me. You just get me. <laughs> I'm Karen Cariani, Senior Director of the WGBH Media Library and Archive and the WGBH Project Director for the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. Alan Gevinson, my esteemed colleague, is in the back managing our audiovisual materials. Uh, he is the Special Assistant to the Chief of the Library of National Audiovisual Conservation Center at Culpeper for the Library of Congress and Project Director for the American Archive for the Library of Congress. So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here celebrating our 50th anniversary. Our first panel is about the origins of public broadcasting, and we're going to start it off with a clip from Newton Minow, because in many ways, we wouldn't be having this event if it wasn't for Newton Minow. He serves on our Executive Advisory Council for the American Archive, and this was, he kind of planted the seed for this event in our minds. Um, so here we are, and we're going to roll a clip with Newton Minow. He was the FCC chairman um, during 1961 to 1963, and very instrumental in getting the Public Broadcasting Act launched. Mr. Chairman, hasn't something happened this week, uh, speaking about the government and television, that is really a revolutionary in this passing of this, this bill for educational television? Yes, uh, the, the president this week uh, signed a bill which, um, for the first time, will uh, commit to federal funds for the uh, construction of, uh, uh, if you'll pardon the term, educational television stations, and to link uh, these stations together this will be the first time that um, it's, it's on a matching basis with states and uh, private uh, institutions uh, that the that federal funds, public funds, will be committed to this uh, purpose. Uh, I think it's a, it's, it's a landmark. You know, in many countries, the government operates broadcasting. We've taken a different course in this country of ours. We've said that broadcasting should be in private hands and the commercial side for private profit but in the public interest. And now we're, uh, we're hoping to develop and build an alternative service for those people who want it. Wish I could be with you in person to welcome you to this important anniversary. Uh, but in my 90s, it's tough to travel. So I'm going to communicate uh, a little history to you this way. What I want to do really is tell you a couple of stories about uh, history. My involvement, really, uh, stemmed 61 years ago. In 1956, during the presidential campaign, my roommate in the campaign travels was Robert Kennedy, who had been sent by the Kennedy family to learn about national campaigns. And they were looking forward, I think, to Jack Kennedy becoming a candidate one day. And Bob and I were the same age, so we were often uh, roommates on the travel. We got to Springfield, Illinois, and uh, Bob turned to me and he said, uh, you and I have heard this same speech 5,000 times. Have we got time to walk over to Abraham Lincoln's house 
so I could see it. I've never been in Springfield. And then we'll get back in time to catch the plane. I said, it's only six or seven minutes. Uh, let's go. So we went over and saw Lincoln's house, and on the way back, uh, Bob Kennedy said to me, he said, you know, you and I each have young children as uh, families. He said, when, when I grew up, Bob said, he said, I thought there were three great influences on a child, the home, the school, and the church. He said, I realize now, raising my own children, there's a fourth, and it's television. He said, my kids are on tele watching television, they're fascinated by television. Can't we do something to improve it, make it more educational and informative for kids? Well, that started uh, a relationship. And then four years later, when his brother was elected president, uh, the day after the election, I got a call saying, would I please uh, consider joining the administration? Uh, and I really said no, because I couldn't afford it. We had young children, had no money. But uh, they pressed and they knew that how interested I was in television. And they offered me the job at age 34 of being chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. How could I resist that? <laughs> uh, we moved to Washington. Uh, the FCC had been in a series of scandals. So the place was a mess. And my job was to clean it up. The first day I was on the job, the first issue I faced was the Senate wanted our testimony on a pending bill to use federal funds to help what was then called educational television. My colleagues all said, in other words, at that time there were seven commissioners, they all said, no, we don't take a position on that. I said, wait a minute. Our job here is to protect the public interest. Certainly this is in the public interest. So by a vote to six to one with my single dissent, we testified in the Senate. I was the one who said that we were very much for this legislation. And I brought today something that long preceded the Public Television Act of 19, of, that later, this is the first act. You see President Kennedy, I'm sort of hidden in the background with the senators and congressmen. This was passed and the president signed it on May 1st, 1962. President John F. Kennedy signing the TV Educational Bill, Senate 205, on May 1st, 1962. The, um, I was privileged to do that. And of course, I realized I had come to the FCC from Chicago, where we had WTTW. President Kennedy had come to the White House from Boston. It was WGBH. Little did we know that there was no public television station in Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States, none in New York City, the largest city in the United States, none in Los Angeles, the largest city on the West Coast. There were very few stations. So I felt the first thing we had to do was get more stations, and the way we did that was to pass two laws. One was called the All Channel Receiver Act, which made television sets have a UHF tuner, which enabled new stations to come on the air. The other was to provide some funding for communities to build uh, public television stations. So we launched what later became what is now today uh, the nationwide system. We also helped public radio, which had preceded television in any way we could. I um, always think that without a station in New York and without a station in Los Angeles, without a station in Washington, it would be impossible to build a national system. So I'm very proud of that. President Kennedy was very proud of it. And um, later, when I left the government, went home to Chicago, I became involved in our local station, WTTW, later became chairman of it, is that public broadcasting 
has grown and developed because it was bipartisan. I tell our board here at WTTW uh, that the most important asset we have is that is the word trust. It doesn't show up in a financial statement, but everyone trusts us. Everyone trusts PBS. Everyone trusts NPR as being honest and fair, and that's why it's so important that now we archive and preserve the great things we've done. We celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Public Television Act. So um, if the first panelist could come up to the stage, that would be great. Um, and that first piece with Eleanor Roosevelt was actually thank, to, thank you to Henry Morgenthau. It was one of the programs that he produced for WGBH. Um, so our, our first panel is about the origins of public broadcasting, and our moderator will be Koki Roberts. Koki Roberts is a political commentator. Oh, please, please, I have it all written out. <laughs> I, well, I'm dying to at least say she was cited by American women in radio and television as one of the 50th greatest women in the history of broadcasting. And in 2008, the Library of Congress named her a living legend, which we totally agree with. Living. So. <laughs> okay. Well, I, um, I am thrilled to be moderating this panel because this is one of the rare times in my life that I'm the kid. Um, this is <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I, um, I joined NPR 10 years after the Public Broadcasting Act was signed, so I've been there 40 years. And uh, these gents uh, preceded me uh, as... Um, Predeceased you? No, no, no. <laughs> Not, I didn't say deceased. Uh, <laughs> uh, they were there at the beginning. And, uh, and so they each have a wonderful story to tell. Ir Irvin Duggan, who is immediately to my left, was in the White House at the time that the bill was passed and then has been very um, active as both an FCC commissioner and as head of PBS. Uh, Nick Johnson was uh, at the FCC and a troublemaker all the time, and, uh, and then did PBS programs uh, as well as um, columns, but uh, was very involved with public broadcasting after he left the FCC. Bill Seemering uh, was really one of the founders of NPR and was the creator of All Things Considered. And uh, Bill is still at it, uh, running, developing radio. He would be happy to accept contributions. And um, <laughs> so I think we'll just start, uh, Irvin, with you and tell us what it was like. How did, how did you get the bill passed? Well, we had Lyndon Johnson, who <laughs> was uh, a, master, <laughs> a master of politics. And um, uh, there's really a, a hidden story about oh, um, uh, how this came about. Um, and I hope that someday a historian will delve into what we call the legislative task forces. Much of the great society legislation, including the Public Broadcasting Act, was crafted outside the White House and even outside Washington. The Carnegie Corporation Commission on Public Broadcasting, for example, uh, the corporation headed in New York. Johnson decreed, and, and Bill Moyers was, I think, the point man on this, that the Great Society legislation should be crafted by these legislative task forces in the universities and the foundations all across the country. This really accomplished two things. It removed the process of drafting uh, policy from the eyes of the press right. and from the atmosphere of partisan politics. It hid the process somewhat. A sort it was of what secret. I would call a, a benign <laughs> secrecy. And I don't think the history has ever been written. But if you look at the 15 members of the Carnegie Commission, you see the man, J.C. Kellum, who headed LBJ's television stations in Texas. You see a Texan, Ovita Culp Hobby. You see the president of the United Auto Workers. Why? Because Johnson wanted a tremendous lobbying push. Um, and if the chairman of the UAW in Detroit 
was one of the people who crafted the, um, the idea for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. That meant that the immense lobbying power then of the United Auto Workers would be behind the bill when it came to the Hill. So all of this was a part of LBJ's uh, legislative genius. And I, as I said earlier, I hope someday a historian will delve into these legislative task forces because it seems to me one of the most creative and, and really praiseworthy, despite the secrecy, uh, one of the most praiseworthy things in that uh, history. Uh, and it is all a part of a larger story. Um, were it not for the dark cloud of Vietnam, I think the LBJ presidency would be remembered as, uh, as the New Deal is remembered, as a, as a flowering of creativity and positive legislation on behalf of the well-being of the American people. I see, it, I see the Great Society chapter, which really ended at about 1967, after the, the Congress changed its composition in 66. I see it as the, the concluding chapter of the New Deal. Johnson told Bill Moyers on the plane coming back from Dallas that he wanted to do all the things that Franklin had been unable to do. And so there was this tremendous uh, election majority that brought on the coattails into the Congress, a tremendous working majority, and he used that majority to pass Medicare, more than 60 education bills, including uh, the great uh, Corporation for Public Broadcasting bill. Uh, the other thing, and Newton Minow mentioned it, was bipartisanship. Uh, the commission was made up of Republicans and Democrats. The support on Capitol Hill came from Republicans and Democrats. To this day, if you look at the trustees of the stations around the country, uh, when I was traveling for PBS to speak to trustees and fundraising dinners uh, around the country for the stations, uh, it was the civic arts and business leadership of every much metropolitan area in the country, made up largely of Republicans. And what they could be counted upon when these periodic uh, outbursts of insanity occur, uh, of, of misguided people wanting to wound, they can't kill, but wanting to wound public broadcasting. These Republican trustees from all over the country get on the phone and say, what are you doing? They're still doing it. They are. And we can count on that. Uh, John, Senator Warner, then of uh, the previous Senator Warner from Virginia, told me once that the Congress would never kill public broadcasting because it now is the only way that a member of Congress can get on television in his local community. <laughs> and uh, so I hope that they are, are inviting uh, their members of Congress to appear frequently. But um, I, w I went to the White House after the great landslide of 64. Um, uh, a, a really a sort of gopher for Douglas Cater, uh, who was in charge of shepherding the Corpor Corporation for Bo Public Broadcasting uh, into reality. And our office in the basement of the West Wing really became a sort of workshop with the members of the Carnegie Commission, uh, first John Gardner of the Carnegie Commission and then Alan Pfeiffer, uh, around the conference table in the office. I would like to claim some creative role in this, but I really was, you know, I came to the White House uh, having been a green reporter for the Washington Post, so I was a kind of gopher, but I was also a watcher. And what I watched was visionary people uh, doing amazing things, and it had a shaping influence. It was a great graduate school of my life. And um, my boss hated to write speeches, and because I had been a newspaper reporter, he would shove all the speech writing off to me. And uh, when, it, when we passed the legislation and Johnson had to make a speech, you know, signing the bill, uh, I was given the task of writing the speech. And about 48 hours before the speech was locked up and sent into what was called the president's night reading, John Gardner, by now the uh, secretary of HEW, called and he said, we need to extend the vision of this speech beyond broadcasting and talk about all public media. And he, d he didn't even know what that meant at the right. time. But, but he, he suggested language, and I want to quote a little bit of it, and then I will stop talking, because it is so prescient and so visionary and so symbolic of all that was going on in that fertile period of our time. Uh, right in the middle of the speech, signing the bill, Johnson said these words, uh, I want to create a great network for knowledge not just a broadcast system, but one that employs every means of sending and storing information. Think of the lives that this could change. The student in a small college could tap the resources of a great university. The country doctor could get help from a distant laboratory or teaching hospital. 
a scholar in Atlanta might draw instantly on a library in New York. Now all this is 30 years before the internet, right. but suddenly uh, the chrysalis is beginning to form and the creative vision of a network for knowledge. The stations of NPR and PBS have not always been receptive, I'm sorry <laughs> to say, to new technology. They are moored on the broadcast technology. And a station manager once said to me when we were trying to create PBS.org, uh, every hour that a viewer spends looking at a computer screen is an hour that he is not watching my station. <laughs> and uh, so there's been a certain hostility. But we know that, that uh, right there in the womb, uh, when the bill was signed, the President of the United States was envisioning something called Networks for Knowledge. Uh, may that uh, increase, may it grow, may the commitment of all public broadcasters to public media uh, flourish in the future. But uh, it was great fun to be right. in on the beginning, though I can't claim anything <laughs> other than a gopher's role. But what a great thing we did. It is now embedded in the culture. It is a, it is a, a part of uh, American life in the way that Medicare, uh, or other great achievements of that time are sewn into the fabric of American life. And heroes of that movement are in this room. May their tribe increase. <laughs> so Nick, what was the role of the FCC in all of this? Well, I would like to go back a little further. Okay. <laughs> uh, since I believe uh, Mr. Morgenthau and I are uh, amongst the, uh, the more uh, uh, age of experience, you know, yeah. And so... The, the, um, the wise men. What? The wise men. Well, not necessarily, as we I often see. I was trying see, to help. But, but uh, <laughs> no, but to go back to the, uh, the 18th century, uh, because uh, <laughs> there are other presidents involved in this besides Lyndon Johnson, uh, with regard to whom I might add an anecdote, that uh, he brought me in in February of 64, and shortly thereafter, a memo went out to all presidential appointees, you may recall this, saying, I want you to tell me what you think would be in the best interests of our nation with the area for which you have responsibility. And in, in my case, at that time, it was ports and shipbuilding and shipping. He made me yeah. maritime administrator, uh, just exactly what you would think, a, a boy from Iowa with... <laughs> the coast of Iowa. The coast of Iowa. We, and, and <laughs> with shipping experience limited to uh, operating a canoe on the Iowa River, but not very successfully. Something that, thankfully, the Commerce Committee found fully uh, adequate to justify uh, the appointment. But um, I, I think that's another thing to say about Lyndon Johnson, that I mean, compared with uh, other presidents, perhaps, who will go unnamed, that there would actually be that focus on what's in the best national interest. But I want to go back to... Um, <laughs> Madison, who I just learned today is referred to by those who work at the Library of Congress as Jimmy Madison. Yes, he was Jimmy. What? He was Jimmy. Spelled J-E-M-M-Y. Is that right? Was yep. it James Madison? Jimmy. Was. I'll be darned. <laughs> what, did your father tell you that? How no, I write his he, he was He was a great son. They would be so proud of you now and everything <laughs> you've done. No, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> Hale and Lindy Boggs, great people. Um, well, anyhow, I, I, I want to go back to um, uh, Jimmy Madison, <laughs> however you uh, spell his name. And there is an inscription as you came into this building you may have noticed. And I'm going to link this up with Thomas Jefferson and then ultimately with uh, uh, public broadcasting and try to do it in, in five minutes or less, is that, if that's all right. All right. Yeah. Less would be better. Less is more. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it contains this line, a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. That's Madison's quote. Jefferson, and many of you may know this, but when writing his own epitaph, chose to be remembered as the father of the University of Virginia and made no mention of the fact that he'd been president of the United States. Now this is, this is very significant, I think, because what these folks were doing 
was recognizing and establishing and making efforts to maintain fundamental pillars of democracy, many of which have always been and continue to be today uh, under attack. One, obviously, is extending the franchise from originally white male landowners over 21 uh, to where now we even let women vote. Um, <laughs> Took a while. It did take a long while, <laughs> um, and and eighteen year olds, um, but then the addition of free public education, a fundamental element uh, and pillar of democracy, and then the idea of independent media, protected by the First Amendment. Um, for Jefferson also said, as famously, as you all know, in writing Edward Carrington, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. And then went on in the next sentence to say, but I should mean that every person should receive those papers and be capable of reading them, again tying it to education. Subsequently, we added the idea of free public libraries, where every American could have access to the resources of kings. And indeed, this library was contributed to by Jefferson in 1815, uh, as you probably know. Um, Something that is often not thought about in this context, but relates to what John Gardner did. Incidentally, he wrote two wonderful books. We wrote a lot of stuff, but that are, are paperback books, one called Excellence, one called Self-Renewal, which I think are always worth rereading at least every 20 or 30 years. Um, because the other thing we did was to establish reduced rates for sending newspapers and books and magazines through the postal system, subsidizing what was at that time the communications network of the 19th century was the post office. And then we added telegraph and telephone and so on. But, uh, that was how it began, and as all of you know, the early uh, time of radio, and I want to tell just one story about Iowa City and then I'm done. Is that okay? okay. Yeah, all right. Uh, the early days of radio involved uh, uh, numerous, 72 in the very early days, uh, educational institutions that did not only the technological work of creating this box in which little people lived and could talk, but also the programming and the focus on the use of this as an instrument of education. In Iowa City, Iowa, from whence I come, a city designated by the United Nations as one of three global cities of literature, uh, was created the first educational radio station west of the Mississippi. Uh, that was in 1911, all right? So this goes back before 1967, for those of, who are younger among us here today. Um, in 1971, uh, uh, WSUI became a charter member of NPR, one of uh, uh, the early few, and one of the 90 stations to carry the inaugural broadcast of uh, Bill's All Things Considered. Um, in 1916, it began transmitting educational content, ultimately including my father's lectures in the 1940s. By the late 1920s, remember this, 1920s, they had educational television uh, broadcasting uh, television images of uh, uh, classroom uh, content, a station that would ultimately uh, be one of the founding stations creating Iowa Public Television, and thus endeth the reading for today. <laughs> well, Bill, that nicely gets us to you. Um, 
The, the fact is, that, you know, we heard all about educational TV, and even though radio came before, uh, it was something of an afterthought in terms of public broadcasting, and you were the person who changed that. It was actually scotch taped uh, at the last minute well, onto the legislation. Right, uh, right. <laughs> and radio. Yeah. And radio. <laughs> it's like it's like the civil rights law putting and sex in and changing women's <laughs> lives forever. But um, so, I, if I if I can note, I I took the position at that time that we ought to forget about television and start with radio, you got literally 10 times more for your dollar with radio than with television. That's still true. Build a really strong, <laughs> that's right. Build a really strong national political base in support of public radio that would then clamor and demand of Congress public television. But to start with public television and underfund it I didn't think was the right political move, no. Bill. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Because you're all, or many of you are historians, uh, and we've had uh, the history of universities, I'd like to just go back. I was, a couple of weeks ago, I was out in Madison, Wisconsin, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the oldest station in the right. nation, the oldest educational station. Continuous project. And, well, but east of the Mississippi. That's right. <laughs> Gee. We could arm wrestle about this. But. <laughs> uh, and uh, tracing this back to the universities, because I think this is very a good point. About 11 years before radio was invented, uh, the university president, Van Hays, in Wisconsin, said, I want the beneficence of the university to be in every home in the state. And it became the motto of the, the so-called Wisconsin idea, the boundaries of the campus are the boundaries of the state. And uh, so that was the idea of extending those resources. And at that time, the very first broadcast east of the Mississippi <laughs> by an educational station was information to farmers, uh, weather information. 61% were, were it was a 61% literacy rate at that time in Wisconsin. Um, as just a sidebar, uh, Koki mentioned that I have an organization developing radio partners, and we're working in Zambia to improve the weather and farming information, where the literacy rate is 61 percent. So, so radio to is, continues to be used <laughs> this way. So um, anyway, uh, that idea continued, and so the beginnings really were there. And I started my career in public radio as uh, an uh, engineer in 1952, working my way through the University of Wisconsin. So uh, that's where I, my roots are there. And there was a uh, Center for, for uh, uh, Innovation and uh, Audio invita Invitation, in Innovation and so on. They're producing uh, radio plays by David Mamet and Arthur Copet and so on. Anyway, it was that, that, that that experience had informed me. Um, I left there and was in Buffalo and <coughs> developed a, a storefront center broadcast facility in the heart of the black community where uh, 27 hours a week came from that, that source. So I was at that time giving voice or helping give voice to folks that had no, there were no people of color really in media at that time. Um, and we had discussions about race on air what is it like to be an African-American in our society? I'd done some work. What with year the, are we in now? We're in 1963 and 4. <clears throat> and um, I did a series on the Iroquois Confederacy, sound portraits of that, of that culture, nation within a nation. Anyway, so when I was tasked as a member of the founding board to, to write the mission statement, um, I felt very strongly about radio. Our first meeting with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I was on the Radio Advisory Committee. And John Macy said to us, well, you know, of course, television has to go first. And of course, television <laughs> always goes first. <laughs> and uh, I was uh, uh, really always frustrated by this, of course, right. because um, so I started a program in Buffalo called This Is Radio. I mean, this is radio. Damn it, pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> Look what, listen to what radio can do. I'm still saying the same thing uh, in development. Anyway, um, so the task was to try to, 
for me, uh, differentiate it from the educational radio, from commercial radio, from PBS, that was, of course, up and running, um, to capitalize the unique strengths of radio as a sound medium, getting out of the studio, telling stories, and uh, to be somewhat aspirational, but also practical. So that was what I was trying to do when I wrote uh, the mission statement. And if you don't mind, I'll just read a few paragraphs of that. <clears throat> National Public Radio will serve the individual. It will promote personal growth. It will regard individual differences with respect and joy rather than derision and hate. It will celebrate the human experience as infinitely varied rather than vacuous and banal. It will encourage a sense of active, constructive participation rather than apathetic helplessness. The total service should be trustworthy, enhance intellectual development, expand knowledge, deepen oral aesthetic enjoyment, increase the pleasure of living in a pluralistic society, and result in a service to listeners which makes them more responsive, informed human beings and intelligent, responsible citizens of their communities and the world. And then in the first description of what became All Things Considered, <clears throat> I said that it would not substitute superficial blandness for genuine diversity of regions, values, and cultural and ethnic minorities <clears throat> which comprise American society. It would speak with many voices and many dialects. The editorial attitude would be that of inquiry, curiosity, concern for the quality of life, critical, problem-solving, and life-loving. The listener should come to rely upon it as a source of information of consequence, that having listened has made a difference in their attitude toward their environment and themselves. And then the concluding uh, paragraph for now. <coughs> Philosophically, time is measured by the intensity of experience. Waiting for a bus and walking through an art gallery may occupy the same duration of time, but not the same time experience. Hmm. <clears throat> Listeners should feel that the time spent with NPR was among their most rewarding in media contact. National Public Radio will not regard its audience as a market or in terms of its disposable income, but as curious, complex individuals who are looking for some understanding, meaning, and joy in the human experience. Well, so now you have a good sense of how it all began. And, uh, and since these gentlemen have been broadcasters, we're finishing right on time at 3 o'clock in time for the next panel. Thank you, gentlemen, very, very much. Um, thank you. Um, thank you all very much. That was wonderful. Um, as we set up for the next panelist, um, would the next set of panelists please come on the stage? Um, we're going to show a clip. Um, the next panel is on news and public affairs and talk shows. And while the panelists get ready, we're going to show you a clip from NPAC's coverage of the Watergate hearings. As Carla Hayden just mentioned, we've just launched a curated exhibit on the AAPB website about public broadcasting's coverage of the Watergate hearings, and that will mark the first time the complete online access to the hearings has been made available to the public online. So will the next panelists come up, and you can run the clip. NPAC brings you gavel to gavel videotape coverage of today's hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here is NPAC senior correspondent Robert McNeil. Good evening from Washington. In a few moments, we're going to bring you the entire proceedings in the first day of the Senate Watergate hearings. Hearings to bear the truth about the wide range of illegal, unethical, or improper activities, established or still merely alleged, surrounding the re-election of President Nixon last year. We are running it all each day because we think these hearings are important and because we think it is important that you get a chance to see the whole thing and make your own judgments. Some nights we may be in competition with the late, late move. We are doing this as an experiment, temporarily abandoning our ability to edit, to give you the whole story, however many hours it may take. 
It reminds one of the final scenes of one of those Shakespearean histories. The forces hostile to the king are rising on all sides. Messenger after messenger rushes in with bad news. But the decisive battle is still some scenes away, and we don't yet know if this is a tragedy we are witnessing. I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency, and that if the cancer was not removed, the president himself would be killed by it. What did the president know, and when did he know it? The fact of the matter is, what we're really pursuing is the president's knowledge, culpability, etc. Uh, isn't the committee actually uh, walking itself out onto a plank? How are they ever really going to resolve the question uh, when you continue to have witnesses like Mitchell and Moore compared to Dean and Magruder and all of these many, many things where there's no way to resolve them? Mr. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? <laughs> I was aware of listening devices. Yes, sir. I deeply regret that this uh, situation has arisen because I think that the Watergate tragedy is the greatest uh, tragedy that this country has ever suffered. I used to think that the Civil War was our country's greatest tragedy, but I do re remember that there were some redeeming features in the Civil War in that there was some spirit of sacrifice and heroism displayed on both sides. I see no redeeming features in Watergate. Well, I'm certainly not a constitutional lawyer, Senator. Well, you remember when we were in law school, we studied a famous principle of law that came from England and also is well known in this country that no matter how humble a man's cottage is, that even the King of England can't enter without his consent? I'm afraid that's been considerably eroded over the years, hasn't it? Down in my country, we still think it's pretty <laughs> legitimate <laughs> principle of law. All right, it is now after three in the morning, unless you live <laughs> in the central time zone, where it's still early, just a few minutes after 2 a.m. So, for the sake of my mother and you other hearty souls who are still with us, I shall be brief. I have only one point to make tonight. John Wesley Dean III may have met his match in Harry Robbins Haldeman. And as a consequence, those open-minded people who long to think in simple, neat terms about Watergate may have had it for a while. In short, we may be right back where we were a few weeks ago. The crucial question of the president's knowledge and possible involvement in the cover-up, as well as that of his top aides, is suddenly as murky and unclear as it ever was. And it's all because of Bob Haldeman. Like everyone else who has appeared before this committee, opinions will undoubtedly vary on the truth and veracity of his total testimony. But any reasonable person would have to conclude that Mr. Haldeman has been an extremely effective witness for his side. His directness, his cool, friendly demeanor, and his air of sincerity have come through. Here again, without commenting on his, on his truthfulness either, the only prior witness to come close to him on both the effectiveness and significance scales was John Dean. So unless those tapes are made public or some other revelation comes our way, the senators, as well as the rest of us who are interested, may have to eventually make an ultimate choice between believing John Dean or Bob Haldeman. That's the way it looks to me, at least, at three or so in the morning. Feel free to disagree. <laughs> For Robert McNeil and Peter Kay, I'm Jim Lara. Good morning. We'll see you again tomorrow night. From Washington, you've been watching Gavel to Gavel videotape coverage and hearing from the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activity. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Henry Becton, the chairman of the Executive Advisory Council for the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. Uh, and when I arrived at WGBH, Henry Morgenthau was uh, in his heyday as an executive producer, and so he was one of my mentors. And one thing that Carla Hayden didn't have time to tell you is that he still has the urge to create. He's just published a book of his poetry, okay. his first book of poetry. I've got a copy over there, and what she didn't tell you is that this is actually a stop on his book tour today. <laughs> 
Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce this next panel and its moderator, Judy Woodruff, um, one of our very special colleagues in public media. Judy began her distinguished career at the CBS affiliate in Atlanta and went on to be White House correspondent for NBC, was the host of Frontline in its early days, uh, host of Inside Politics for CNN, guest correspondent for NPR, author of several books and co-founder and chairperson of the International Women's Media Foundation, and along the way has been honored by many distinguished organizations. So thank you, Judy, uh, for helping us today, and we promise to get you out of here and back ready to prep for the news hour tonight. <laughs> All yours. Henry Becton, thank you very much. <laughs> Henry Becton, of course, being one of the pillars of public media for uh, so many years, uh, Boston and the whole country has so much to thank you for. Thank you, Henry. So I'm the lucky one now because I get to preside over this panel of five megastars uh, in public media, the pantheon of news and public affairs. Uh, each one of them has played an absolutely essential role in keeping public media, public television, and radio at the center of American life. Uh, none of them needs an introduction, so I'm going to be very brief, uh, starting with my mentor, uh, the man you just saw uh, in that clip, the former anchor and executive editor uh, of the News Hour with Jim Lehrer, and before that, uh, the co-anchor and executive editor of the McNeil Lehrer News Hour, the McNeil Lehrer Report from 1975 until 2011, the face of and the singular driving force behind daily journalism at PBS, all of this following a distinguished career in newspapers. Jim Lehrer. He Next. still needs a haircut, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Next, my boss today, uh, I don't feel any pressure at all up here, the president and CEO of WETA, Washington, D.C.'s flagship public television and radio stations since 1989. Uh, before that, she served as a member and chair of the board of the Corporation of Public, of public Broadcasting, as well as a member of the WETA WETA board for following her service on the West Virginia Educational Broadcasting Authority, Sharon Percy Rockefeller. <laughs> the executive director and co-founder of Radio Bilingue, Inc., the National Latino Public Radio Network, in 1976, he was the moving force of a group of Latino farm workers, artists, activists, and teachers who founded Radio Bilingue in California, San Joaquin Valley. Hugo Morales. <laughs> Someone who's already been applauded here, the longtime host of The Dick Cavett Show. Over five decades, his remarkable career in television has spanned networks from ABC, USA, HBO, and of course, PBS. He's appeared in movies, TV specials, and several Broadway plays. Dick Cavett. <laughs> and finally, the aforementioned living legend. <laughs> uh, the woman who moderated the last panel with a mm -mm year background <laughs> along with me in broadcasting, political commentator for ABC News, and of course for NPR, contributor to the McNeil Lair News Hour advisor to the American Archives of Public Broadcasting, Cokie Roberts. Yes. <laughs> so what we're charged with doing is looking at, at how news and public affairs came into being and how it evolved in public media. Jim, I'm going to start with you. You were there almost at the beginning. Uh, when you came to Washington, it was all about Watergate. We saw that clip. What happened? Well, the Watergate... Um the Watergate hearings really did, that was, that was the watershed event for news and public affairs on public television. Up to that point, the, uh, the stations and the public was generally divided over whether they even needed uh, any more news and public affairs on television beyond what was already there on commercial television. The Nixon administration particularly didn't think there was a need for any more news and public affairs <laughs> on public broadcasting. But the Watergate, the Watergate hearings 
changed everything. And the reason it changed was because of a, there were several individuals who, who had the courage to make some really tough decisions. And one of them was not to necessarily to broadcast them gavel to gavel, because many of the stations would not broadcast it live because they had educational TV on during the daytime. But somebody, and I was part of the mix, the, the somebodies, so why the hell don't we run them at night? Repeat them at night. And um, that was a big, big deal. It was a big decision. And uh, the people who were running PBS were nervous about it, so they said, let's poll the stations. So, but the, the, we did pull the stations, but we pulled the stations in a very clever way. <laughs> right. Pulled the stations with a question that was kind of phrased in such a way, do you want to be, do you want to be patriotic or do you want to be a jerk? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and we still barely won a majority. <laughs> and, uh, but and, as McNeil said at the time, uh, uh, and I, I quote him almost uh, verbatim, uh, well, the option, because it was summertime, and PBS didn't have that much to run at night. Any, they had no original programs to run at night anyhow. So he said, well, all they would, all they would run if they didn't run the hearings would be, well, how did he put it, um, English-speaking people talking, <laughs> animals mating, <laughs> and occasionally English-speaking people mating and animals talking. <laughs> <laughs> so why not replace it with the Watergate hearing? So, that's why when I said 3 a.m., the hearings weren't going on until 3 a.m. That was the repeat every night. We would do it live all day, but we only had about maybe half the stations were watching it. We're, we're, we're broadcasting it, but at night, uh, they, and at first some, it wouldn't, you know, we, and they, it was the old story, you know, the, uh, 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 the big stations wouldn't take it, and then, but then they started because the word got out and then suddenly it became, it became a big deal. And the big, the big deal was that it proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was a role for news and public affairs on public broadcasting because of those hearings. And out of that came the news hour and everything else. So when you and Robin cooked up the McNeil, the, it was McNeil, Robert McNeil report, then quickly the McNeil Lair report, it, it and then. Began, it began, as I've said a million times, it began with the worst title in the history of television, the Robert <laughs> McNeil report. <Yeah. laughs> and I was the Washington correspondent, and then it became, my mother, my mother interceded and became the McNeil Lair report. But, it, it was one story a day for 30 minutes when we started. And then, in, then in, that was 75, and then 83, it went to an hour, became the news hour. And that's where I want to bring in Sharon Rockefeller, because Sharon, you were already active in public broadcasting, and you knew what Jim and Robin were trying to do. What were you up against when they tried to go to an hour? The stations, <laughs> in many senses. Uh, I was working. I was familiar with West Virginia Educational Broadcasting Authority, not on the board at that time, because my husband wasn't governor, and that was a gubernatorial appointment. Uh, at the time, actually, I asked for one thing from my husband. Can I be appointed to the WVEBA? And he said yes, and I, no one ever thought twice about it, but that was my training. That's where I learned. But the Watergate hearings, actually, I watched every single day all day long. Jay had lost an election by the largest margin in the history of the state. In 1972, we had four years in exile in Buchanan, West Virginia, three hours north of Charleston, three hours south of Pittsburgh, but an hour and a half from the Morgantown, West Virginia University station. So when the Watergate hearings were on, in that I could not receive the Washington Post by mail until two days after it was published, I started watching full time. My kids were watching Sesame Street. I loved history, Adam's Chronicles, Masterpiece. But news and public affairs was my main attraction. It was what we had to offer. We, at that point, was little old public television. And it, it was the turnaround. I also came on the WETA board at the same time through another vehicle, a friend of mine on the Stanford University board, which had one woman on the board, and I was taking her place. She was the founder of, this is in the 70s, yeah. 
lest we forget. Uh, she was the founder of KQED, Caroline Charles. So she said, where do you live? I said, West Virginia, San Francisco, thank you. <laughs> she said, where's that? <laughs> and I, she said, is it near the Dakotas? I said, no. <laughs> is it near the Carolinas? No. Uh, but she knew Mrs. Campbell, and she called her immediately. I was 29. She said, you have to talk to this young woman. I didn't know what about. But Mrs. Campbell called me in a very authoritarian way. You must come to Washington right now, which I did. I've always taken my orders from Elizabeth Campbell. Wow. And that's how I got involved with WETA. So I had a very small, poor rural state. And at that point, WETA was not as wealthy as it is today. It had a budget of $4 million. Now we're at $97 million. But we've clawed our way up. And it's really through news and public affairs, the Watergate he hearings put public television on the map and WETA and the News Hour, which came about in 1983 because we thought it, we should be the first in that all stations were going to go to one hour of news. In fact, they never did. We did, but we won, if you recall, Robin and Jim and I went around to visit the stations, speak to them, and we called them they on didn't the really want it. We, we did not want it. We, we divided really, up. We divided right. up the, the 300 and some public television stations and... and uh, we called every Everyone. station manager or program manager because uh, Irv's successor as president of PBS said, well, it, it's a great idea to go to an hour, but I don't have the power to do it. You're going to have to get the stations to do, get the stations to do it. So we physically called them on the phone. And, and then there was a vote. And we won by six votes That's right. to go to an hour mm -hmm. and uh, out of 300 and, uh, 300 and some. And, exactly. Uh, I felt like, oh, never mind. And all you need is all you need is <laughs> one more than Absolutely. the other guy. Absolutely, the democracy, <laughs> democracy won. Right, and as I say, the rest is history. So Dick Cavett, while all this was going on uh, in the in the daily news, daily journalism world, you were you had a very successful career as a as an interviewer in commercial television. What was the appeal of public television? Well, I noticed in something about today <clears throat> that among the things they thought might come up would be the question of why I moved my show from uh, network television to PBS. I was fired. <laughs> uh, That'll hope, do it. That's not too loquacious a way to put it, but that, that's pretty much what happened. So that kind of um, <laughs> opened the door, paved the way, whatever cliche you prefer. Uh, it was a wonderful change. With our network television, I was, of course, delighted to get a show, terrified and very nervous at first. Uh, and the trouble there, of the kind that would come up on network, so-called uh, non-public television, so to speak, started on the first day. I thought I had a wonderful show to present them as my first show to be played about a week later. Muhammad Ali, Gore Vidal, and Angela Lansbury did a wonderful, talky, wonderful. lively show. <laughs> and wow. foolish boy from Nebraska that I am, I went backstage to be congratulated by an ABC vice president who sort of shepherded the show. And I saw his expression didn't seem appropriate for a show that he loved. <laughs> I think it was worded, who the, let's say hell, uh, gives a damn, that's a better word, what Muhammad Ali and Gore Vidal think about Vietnam. Mm. Well, obviously that had come up. Second brilliant part of his reaction was, we can't really air that as the first show because of that, and um, we're going to air it as the second show. And I seem to remember saying, are you going to be like this all along? <laughs> <laughs> and I saw Agent Sam Cohn wince over in the corner. <laughs> and uh, they did. They did that. I did a second show that was nice. And we had them both. And they aired the second show first. And it got mildly uh, enthusiastic reaction. And then they aired the first show the second night. And reviewers were reviewing the whole week. So. 
almost everybody said about the second show, the Cabot show really found itself on the second show. <laughs> <laughs> I was sure that, uh, see, the man who'd been waiting backstage for, for me, congratulate me, got a copy of that for me, just to be sure. <laughs> so that sort of thing happened. And then there were other kinds of troubles that I would not have gotten on and didn't on PBS. One involved that lovable old couple, the John Lennons, uh, <laughs> and uh, they came on, and that was an event, and other people were jealous, and the reviews were big, and the ratings were big, and that was nice, and they even came back. John, when I met him a week earlier, before the first one, said, I said, why do you want to do this, really? There can't be much you need at this point. And he said, well, you have the only halfway intelligent show uh, on television. And I said, why would you want to be on a halfway intelligent show? <laughs> and he laughed, as many of you did, and we were friends from that point. But on the second show, who'd have guessed the agreement had been that we would do one of their songs? And John said, well, why don't you do one of Yoko's songs? Uh, it, it had the um, catchy title, Woman is the Nigger of the World. <laughs> and uh, I thought, are, are they kidding? <laughs> but I, by God, we did this song, and nothing happened, the world would blow up. But before it was aired, I was told that it would not be aired, the song. And I complained. And they said, well, all right, we will air it, but our decision is that you will make a statement beforehand mm -hmm. about the dangers of watching it, I guess. <laughs> I remember one of the, well, oh, and there were 412, perhaps, protests about the song. None of them about the song, though, but as one woman put it, about that mealy mouth speech you made Dick deliver this before. <laughs> <laughs> My delivery sort of encouraged that. <laughs> So, so getting, getting to PBS was a, a, a going into a green meadow in a way. Uh, well, I want to hear more about the green meadow. Um, but okay. Koki, I want to come to you because we heard Bill Simmering and I think Irvin Duggan both say words to the effect that they felt that NPR should have had a, the early head start, early boost that PBS did. Did you feel that when you first went oh, to sure. NPR? Oh, sure. It's still true to some degree. Uh, but, um, but it turned out to be a blessing I think in the end, Bill could probably talk about this more, um, that it was kind of a secret uh, at first because at the point when Nixon did go after television and basically the television network committed suicide, um, the NPR was still there and there was no necessity to disband it because it wasn't on the radar. And so um, the uh, ability to just grow and, and thrive uh, was much easier in that environment. But then the growing and thriving uh, became something quite dramatic. And, and as of today, uh, we are listened to by more people than the three, you know, Morning Edition is listened to by more people than the three network uh, morning shows combined. Um, it is listened to by more people than anything other than Rush Limbaugh. And I keep saying, you know, Steve Inskeep should get what Rush gets, right? Um, but um, because the difference in ratings is about a half a million people. And, um, and so it is wildly successful and really the primary source of news for millions and millions of people around the world. And commercial radio has pulled back from news right. dramatically right. over That's the years. That's also true. Leaving a, a, a big opening for... So, Hugo Morales, you were paying attention to all this oh, yeah. uh, in California, but you and some of your friends uh, decided there was something missing. What did you see? Well, first of all, there was little, or at that time, little or no uh, news on radio, and that is true today. In uh, Spanish language commercial radio, there is no news. I mean, it sounds maybe some of us shocking. Most of us believe in the mission, but it's absent. I mean, it's a, it's a shocking truth that there is, there is no news in Spanish language radio except for Radio Bilingue. And uh, when we got started back in 76, or let's, let's take the, when we went on the, we got started in 1976, but in 19, we got started on July 4th, 1980. 
If you look at like 1980, the population of Latinos in the U.S. was around 15 million, which is about 6.5% uh, uh, of the U.S. population. Uh, now it's 58 million, and 18% of the population, and 72% of Latinos speak Spanish at home. Uh, so this is not something of the past. You know, some of us were young at that time, right? Uh, and that we had big dreams. Uh, and but rather it's something that is very relevant today and yet there is no news in Spanish language commercial radio and uh, so stunning. it is very very stunning it's 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 a story that uh, some of us don't want to perhaps believe but it, but it is true and uh, so back in 1976 when we, we started organizing when I started organizing Radio Bilingue in, in Fresno. Uh, you know, it's a community that I came to because I was born in Oaxaca, raised in uh, Sonoma County where the fires were recently, and, and then went to the San Joaquin Valley because that's the largest concentration of farm workers in the United States, which is and still it is today. Uh, you know, it's, it's in the among the people that I came in contact with, they saw the same thing. All these uh, uh, Chicanos, Mexican Americans, all of us, all, all of them were U.S. born except for me. I was the only immigrant. And all of us were bilingual uh, uh, and uh, educated. We were the first generation of, of Latinos to be open the doors to higher education. So that contributed a lot to why Rather Bilingual was founded because we saw this degree of limitation of public broadcasting, but not, public, not just public broadcast, but I mean, you know, English language media that we as Latinos, our families could not, could not access right. just because of the language. And so, uh, but it's just not just the language, because the language, uh, you know, and I see everybody here, you know, there's, there's much more than the language, there's the culture, there's the history and, and, and the nuances of language. There's a literature, there's a poetry, there's arts, right. there's all that. And that was absent in terms of, of that. And, and we as young people thought, well, wow, you know, it seems like our, our, our treasures, our community treasures, are hidden treasures. We have so much, uh, you know, wealth of, of, of history. We have so much wealth of art uh, and so forth in our communities. And we should be able to to share that and learn from one another. So that's why we established Radio Bilingue in 1976 and then went on the, on the air in 1980. And it's still going. And it's still going. And we also also believed, of course, that public affairs, news of public affairs had to be part of it because what we wanted to do is just like in this situation, we wanted uh, to us as, as Chicanos, Mexican-Americans, as Latinos, to tell the story, mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. our own narrative to be inclusive. I mean, if you look at, for example, the prison population uh, today in the United States, uh, you know, something like 19% of the, of the uh, imprisoned population in the U.S. is Latino. So a lot of our communities in need, the highest dropout rates from high schools continue to be Latinos in the United States. Uh, and yet you see the figures of how we are a significant now number of Latinos and we'll, and we'll project it to, to grow even larger. So that's what we found around the belief because we wanted that to happen. So we've been able to document and follow some of the stories that some of the other media uh, have, have not. Uh, for example, there's, there's a case of an of, uh, of, uh, uh, indigenous uh, uh, woman living in the South who was denied uh, you know, parenting her, uh, her child at, at birth because she could not communicate in English to a physician. Or, or, or Spanish because oh. mm -hmm. uh, she spoke a native language from my home state mm -hmm. of Oaxaca. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's that kind of a case where uh, you know, some community uh, folks there from, from, I think it was Alabama, called our station and told them the story, we broke the story, and, and, and then the mainstream media picked it up and eventually she recovered her child. But that's the kind of stories that we're covering. Or, I mean, right now what's happening, talk about the need, there's, there's uh, a lot of fear among our families about you know, deportations. Mm -hmm. 
And maybe to those of us in this room, it's, it's just another topic, but to people who listen to us or our listeners, it's very, very personal. I mean, we, I mean, just uh, I think about a month, a couple months ago, we had a, a call from uh, uh, a mother from Tracy, California, when we opened the lines and we were also giving out information at that time, the opportunity to renew DACA. And she was saying that her son had gone into depression after the election. He knew what was about to happen. And he was a DACA recipient. And he had quit his college upon after the election. And then soon later, he quit his job. So the mother was very worried about, about her son and what was about to happen. So this is the kind of stories and narratives that are carried around the community. You're, you're uh, touching uh, stories of all American lives, and that's what public broadcasting, public media was founded to do. Jim, let's talk next uh, for a few minutes about how hard or not it's been to survive as public <laughs> media, as news and public affairs in public media. A lot of competition out there, the news, the commercial, uh, news environment has changed so drastically. Um, why has public media remained, and news and public affairs remained as strong as it has, do you think? Well, first of all, we, McNeil and I said at the very beginning uh, and that if people started, if commercial television came along, when cable started growing, in fact, particularly, if they started doing what we're doing, we'd quit doing it. There's no point in our, our, our doing uh, uh, what's, already, what's available elsewhere. We'll go on and do something else. And uh, we had a lot of ideas of other things that we could do. But as we sit here now, nobody's doing it. Right. And, uh, and in fact, there is more, more, now more than ever, they would say, uh, the kinds of journalism that is practiced on the news hour uh, is more needed now than ever before <laughs> because journalism on television has had its own growth and its own kinds of uh, changes and uh, they, those changes have been away from the kind of separation of, of, of straight reporting from analysis, from opinion, that sort of thing, which is still true of the news hour but not true in, some, of the, in some elements of commercial television, particularly cable television. And so the reason for our being, let's put it, just get to the cut to the chase, the reason for our being is stronger now than it has ever been. Good point. Uh, I will <laughs> let that just sit there because I think it's right. Um, but Sharon, as somebody who has to look at this both, you know, as you know journalists very well, but you have to think about it as a manager, as an executive, how hard has it been to keep news and public affairs going? And, and I, we should add, I mean, you, you oversee the Ken Burns, you know, it's not just the News Hour uh, and Washington Week, it's the Ken Burns shows and, and many others. Well, I think what's one of the things that's great about the public television audience is that it, it's pretty well educated. Above all, it continues to want to learn. So keeping up on a daily basis is important, but putting in context weekly, as we do on Washington Week, is very important. And history, the arts, science, kids, all of the rest means we serve so many different people in so many different ways, but our signature is the news and public affairs. It's the hardest to fund, and yet our membership money essentially helps subsidize, although we raise a lot for the news hour, we raise a good bit for Washington Week, but we never make a profit, let's put it that way. We always reinvest in the product and could spend a lot more than we take in. I think it is our trademark, our signature. We're very proud of it, and I think our audience is proud to be associated with what we do. But, the, but it's always been difficult to keep right. it funded, right. always. We've never had, the, we don't even, the, the word surplus doesn't even, doesn't even <laughs> right. it's not even in our vocabulary. In our vocabulary. We're always under, uh, way, way over, either over budget or having to cut back, and, and that's been from day one. And I hate to say this, but uh, at the very beginning when we first started, which was now 37, 38 years ago, there was a commercial television guy named Marvin Kalb. I ran into him socially. We'd been on the air a year or two at that point. 
And uh, I, I didn't know Marvin Kalb. And he said, yeah, well, you guys are doing things. You know, he said, but be, let me give you a warning. And I said, yeah, what's that? He said, don't let them give you too much money. And I said, not a that's problem. not a problem. Not a problem. <laughs> but that's right. but just, for the, just for the hell of it, tell me why. Yeah. And he told a quick story. And he had, he had scads of them, but one in particular. Uh, 90 News, CBS News, they, he, uh, Czechoslovakia has been invaded. He was going to do a minute, he would, a minute and a half thing on it. It's going to be a major story. Uh, they kept cutting it back, cutting it back, cutting it back in about oh, a minute before air or two minutes before air. They got some great fire footage from downtown Little Rock. Now, nobody was hurt in the fire, just great Picture. pictures of fires. And they cut his report back to 20 seconds. Mm. And he said, if they hadn't had the money to buy that fire footage, <laughs> I would have had my minute and a half. So, it, it, and, and it was, but it was, it's clearly a second of my mind because I just told the story again. <laughs> and, uh, but it, it, and, and McNeil always said that too, you know, if we get, if you would get too fat and sassy, you'll, you'll, you will, you will send, you'll do things that you will do them, you, you'll do things that you, that, that are not required. This way, we, you're limited by, by, by money limits you to do what you must do rather than what you just kind of want to do. Yeah. Well, I would, in radio, that's really not true because what we're doing is opening bureaus all over the place. And when we're living in a world where what happens in Syntagma Square in Athens affects your 401k, uh, then you need to have more international coverage rather than less, and, and of course more national coverage, understanding what's going on in this country. And so uh, really the money goes to, to those very expensive foreign bureaus, which are very, very difficult to do, but I, I would argue essential. Uh, in this time, and uh, so I, we, we need all the money we can get. Thank you. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, it's probably a story I shouldn't have told. <laughs> <laughs> well, but Jenny, sure, the yeah. one thing I would say is, um, sorry to interrupt, that corporations w in the early days, we went to ver AT and T, et cetera, et cetera. We got huge amounts of money in retrospect. That has diminished drastically, but foundations have really upped the ante and they understand they're more visionary, they have a lot of money now, and it's not that we've never had a surplus, but foundations and individuals who support the program now. We have, you know, you can give as an individual to support the PBS NewsHour, which was never possible That's before, true. but we're doing that in a membership kind of way. Did, you have did, the, did, the, did the funding situation affect the work you were able to do, do you think, in any way? You, Dick. I recognize my name, but it wasn't. <laughs> Gee, I like fires. <laughs> what a story that is. <laughs> um, I was never thoughtful um, or thinking about such things as funding. I, 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 it's a bad habit <laughs> and sort of frame of mind for me. Uh, and I, I had to be urged every now and then to make a phone call or make an effort or something like that. But, but I was thinking of shows that I was able to do where people say, oh, you're going into public television now. That's for intellectuals. Um, I, I, intellectual is a very dangerous label to have put on you when you're in television, whether it's public or, or uh, <coughs> the other sort. Um, but I remember appreciating the fact that ABC would have gotten a little nervous when I would have on England's great entertaining performer, actor, philosopher, teacher, Jonathan, the great Jonathan Miller, one of the greatest intellectuals in captivity, uh, and would have him on five nights in a row a couple of times, and, and people wanted more. I can imagine trying to do that uh, elsewhere, shall we say. So I, I really wasn't conscious of funding in ways that probably were harmful to me because I'm sure I might have been able to help with it if I had pitched in in certain ways. But did you, so did you feel the freedom to do pretty much what you wanted when you were working at PBS, to go interview the people you wanted and do the, kind of feel the, do the kind of programming you wanted to do? Oh, I did, yes. I, I usually just did the kind of program I wanted to do. And, and in, in the main, I got away with it. I'm not a, 
aware of any particular gripes of the sort I was used to uh, on, on ABC. Well, good. Oh, we'll take I, that. I, 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 <laughs> am I disgustingly happy? <laughs> it's good. We like it. I, I'm going to come back to Hugo because, I mean, how do you see this picture of question of resources? I mean, how much of an issue is it? Do you, are you able to ignore it? Um, or, I mean, how, do, how does it affect what you're able to do? Uh, well, first of all, I want to say that it's really, really important that we maintain that independence of public broadcasting, whether it be on radio or television. Yeah. And that's a value that we always have shared and something we have to be militant about. And that is true also for Radio Bilingue. So how do you build not just a station, but in this case a network. We have uh, 12 full power FMs and we have 60 affiliates. How do you build a network uh, where you're serving people with literally no disposable income, right? I mean, so it's, it's, uh, it's you know, so part of it is the employees subsidize the service in part, which spend the history of public television, public radio, at least at the beginning. Subsidize how? Low salaries, for example. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for, for, for starters. And the other is to be able to, to keep those employees. You know, that's a real, real challenge for us. Uh, but the other is that uh, it's foundations that have, yeah. we, we managed to attract. But uh, as the competition for that has grown, our, our share of that has gone lower for public uh, uh, affairs and for news and information from the foundation as competition for those dollars. So it's really, really difficult for us. And so I would say that, uh, that for news and information in, in Spanish through us, it's really, really difficult for us to, to maintain that. So that leads to my last question for all of you. How do you see the future of news, the future of public affairs in radio and television? Do you feel confident about it? I mean, I like to feel very confident about it yeah. because wherever I go, I get I hear good things about the news hour. But what do you I feel what totally do you hear? Confident. Um, I I think that uh, one of the things that we're learning is that Congress actually likes NPR, um, and uh, they they can't always say it out loud. <laughs> but um, but the truth is is that uh, it gets back to what Nick was saying earlier. They're all you know they're on. And, and it's in all of their districts, and it is the source of news. Um, but of course, the federal funding is a tiny percentage of NPR money. It's really just for the satellite. But the, yeah. um, but the stations rely on it a lot, particularly the small rural stations. And that, that's an important thing to keep in mind, that these are people who have really are desperate um, for this kind of information. And, and sometimes it's also the only uh, emergency signal, you know, all of that. And so um, I think that the, the fact of, of the service is so uh, widespread and diverse and so well listened to by people in all areas of American life that I, I feel very confident about the future. But I do think it requires resources. You know. I was going to say that the last two years, the last year and a half, have proven more than ever the need for what we do. Right. It is so complex, depressing to many, hopeful to those who thought they were electing someone who would stand for them. But the country is changing so fast. The political system is practically impossible to understand. We despair of being ungovernable. But who brings some sense and order and rationale to what happened today and this week and this year, plus analysis, plus thoughtful, complex, sensitive um, ideas about what might happen in the future? We are doing that in a way that nobody else is. And if we just stay true to our mission, stick to the straight and narrow, I think we've got a great future in news and public affairs. I agree 100%. And I, uh, yeah, I think it's been great. Every, I, I every I'm, one I'm, of us. There. Oh, I'm sorry. Two vaudevillians competing. Two vaudevillians. <laughs> 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 After you, my dear Alphonse. I was just going to say amen and add a couple of lines. <laughs> the, 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 the basic need for the free press was set up by the founders 
And the, the key to our democratic society is an informed electorate, an informed public. The only device that the founders created by the, through the First Amendment was the free press. That's the device for people to get information, to cast informed votes, and, and all levels in government. And uh, we are, we, what, what we, we in public broadcasting, but we in journalism, we who facilitate journalism, we who practice it and we who participate in it at any level are part of a democratic process that is particularly critical right now with this explosion of information that's coming out, with the tsunami of electronic this and, and that gadget and this, all this kind of, we're, it, 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 this is a critical time. And uh, I, agree, I agree with what uh, Sharon said. We must not lose sight of what our purpose is. And it, it isn't about making people laugh. It isn't about people making cry, make them cry. It's about keeping them informed enough to function as 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 informed people in this country, informed citizens. Thank you. Uh -huh. Dick, Dick. I too agree with Sharon on that, uh, particularly in this. Um, you don't agree with me? <laughs> I'll get to you in a minute. Oh, okay. <laughs> I always have. You know. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> but uh, as we are all uh, living in this sea of what seeming time of plague, um, <laughs> certainly there has to be the, the service that only uh, public broadcasting can, can do so well and continue to be this great garden of thrilling, varied, wonderful things that are not available uh, elsewhere. Uh, on television. They're, they're still not beholden, and they are, s public television is still vital to our lives. Sounds corny, but I believe it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I just want to... If you're uh, not optimistic, you can't speak. I am <laughs> optimistic. I am optimistic, and I agree with uh, this distinguished uh, panelist. Um, and it's in terms of uh, Spanish language uh, um, news and information, I think the need is there for basic information along with you know, news and information to the Latino community. And I think the future uh, uh, for uh, Spanish language media is to be able to communicate that at forums. So thank you for the invitation. Um, or what the reality is and the need for that because it's so critical and so Thank you very, very much. So critical, so critical. I just want to, I want to thank all of the panelists, but I also want to quickly read a little bit of an email uh, we at the News Hour got yesterday from our colleague Jeff Brown, who had been interviewing inmates at San Quentin Prison for a story they're working on about uh, a podcast they're producing, which is going to appear on the News Hour. But what, what I want to share with you is Jeff wrote all of us to say, that several dozen inmates in different parts of the prison, different places from different parts of the country, came up to him and the crew while they were there to say, hey, PBS, we Watch don't know it. what we would do without <laughs> PBS. Wow. Um, you know, let's, banks. let's hope they stay tell. in. <laughs> You're probably right, but no. They, but they, they went on to say uh, how much the program means. While Jeff is interviewing an inmate in one cell, they can hear the program in the next cell being listened to. Um, so I just want to say that we, are re we reach people in public media in every corner of this country. We're not just in the intellectual right. capitals and the political capitals and the places of great wealth. We are in, in, in parts of the country where people are struggling and trying to get their lives back together. And those are the stories that we will always tell. Uh, along with all the others. So they, what an amazing panel. Well, Thank you. If they were to, if they were, some of those inmates were to uh, join their local public broadcast, <laughs> they could it'd be a f wonderful funding credit. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We I, thought about I would that. just tell you one quick story because it's so funny. It, it, it gets to the excellent point you just made. At one point when Susan Stamberg was the regular host of All Things Considered and she took a leave to write a book, uh, a farmer wrote to her and said, my cows won't give milk. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> and he, they, he was always going into the milking barn and turning on all things considered, and they heard Susan and gave milk. You hear and, the milk. Coming. And without Susan, no milk. So oh, <laughs> okay, you heard it. That's good. Uh, thank you, everybody, and thank you to the panels. Um, we're going to take a short break now. However, we hope you will stay to watch some of the clips we've put together to wrap up this previous panel and launch the next panel, which is documentary style and use of archives, which will begin at 4 o'clock. Thank you. Boy image. It's Texas that's produced a bevy of female vice presidential mentions in recent years. In 1972, the state legislator Francis Sissy Farenthold sought the vice presidential nomination at the Democratic Convention in Miami Beach. Though she came in second, Farenthold says men didn't take her seriously. I go back and think of 72. I was down on the convention floor. But I was told and people phoned in because they were chagrined that Walter Cronkite said there is a lady named Farenthold from Texas that wants to be vice president. And then the thing went off to a commercial. So um, that wouldn't happen this time. Texan Ann Armstrong was ambassador to Britain when Republicans talked of her as a running mate for Gerald Ford in 1976. That's past history. I think it's part of what's happening today uh, that it was in the news. But happened to be Ann Armstrong uh, being considered, but I think what's exciting now is that there, there are not just one being mentioned, uh, but that we've really got a host of women who are fully qualified to be president. And both parties have it. The women were always there, power of truly and power developing, but in the past year, year and a half, it has become, it has surfaced, and it is tricking the conscience. Then Texas Congresswoman Barbara Jordan aroused the 1976 Democratic Convention with her keynote address, the first to be given by a woman or a black, and supporters briefly floated a Barbara Jordan vice presidential balloon. Now a professor at the University of Texas, Jordan believes the men in charge of the political parties better get used to the idea of a woman on the ticket. I would be the last to uh, denigrate the uh, judgment and wisdom and farsightedness of male politicians. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, I don't think they quite realize how volatile this involvement of women is or portends to be. And I think this is not seen because this is not in our experience. This is not in our American political experience. It will be seen. They don't see it now. They can't internalize it. But it's going to occur, and it's going to be a surprise to them. Says National Women's Caucus Chair Wilson, who keeps in touch with the presidential campaigns, the Democrats could produce the surprise this summer. I think that, that it is possible that three hours before the decision is made, um, the male nominee may, may very well see that this is the trump card to victory. What odds would you give it? I'd say 50-50 right now. Democratic presidential candidates Walter Mondale and Gary Hart have both said they would consider women as running mates. And Jesse Jackson has committed himself to putting a woman on the ticket if he is the nominee. Robin? Do you know what I'd like to learn from you, if nothing else? How you think about a question. Um, I'm serious about this. And let me put one to you. And if you could possibly tell me how you would go about thinking about that question. 
A friend of mine once said about someone we both know, whenever he tries to think, he sits down and tries to think, but nothing comes into his head. <laughs> and I, I think all of us have had that at times. We've just <clears throat> thought, I wonder how a systematic, orderly, perhaps logically trained mind would think when confronted with a question. Now, let me, let me put one to you. Cast your mind back a few years, and your son is of draft age and eligible, you can probably see this coming, to go to Vietnam and be in a combat unit. <clears throat> it would have to cross your mind, I think, or if not for purposes of my example, that you might have some mixed feelings about this. Now, how, how do you lay out a question like that and think about it? Do I want him to go? Do I tell him to go? Do I encourage him to go? Do I let him go with reluctance and so on and so on? But, I mean, do you see what I'm asking? Yeah. Is there a way you scheme sure, out a question? Sure, sure. Well, in, 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 the in the first place, I think that um, I, I would have said to myself to begin with, uh, my, uh, my thought about this is going to tend, is going to have a bias toward the self-serving. If there it's is... self-serving. That's right. If there is a reason to... Uh, if, if, if there's anything on which I can contrive a negative scaffolding that will uh, excuse uh, his going, Mm -hmm. I will make. I will. I will tend in the direction of making that effort. So if number step one, step one is recognize know, know your yourself, bias. Know yourself, right? Step right. one, recognize that. Okay. Uh, uh, secondly, having done that, I would, however, say, don't so compensate for the fact that your bias is there, as to constipate your mind. Mm -hmm. uh, if there are arguments there that are reasonable and persuasive, go ahead and flush them out. In other words, there might be a good reason for deciding Absolutely. no besides yeah. my yeah. bias. Yeah. yeah. Now, well before my son reached the age of 18, we had published a national review that there was no justification for the Vietnam War as it was being fought. That's right. There is, uh, 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 in my judgment, no case to be made for a tentative war, uh, one the exercise uh, of which is less than a total commitment. Mm -hmm. Five. My son was a born asthmatic and was 4F, so mm -hmm. that the whole exercise was academic. True. But if, if it hadn't been, then, first step is recognize your bias. I suppose second step is what is the question I'm asking, isn't yeah. it? it, it and the question, what, what is the question yeah. here? And, Can and, I and, justify right. my son's then, then you, not you, going to Vietnam? Right. Then you put it through, the, the, in effect, the Kantian test, uh, that uh, any conclusion that you reach, reach you ought to be prepared to deal as a universal, uh, i.e., if you say uh, uh, society owes me such and such, mm -hmm. you must be prepared to say that society owes everybody in your condition such and such. And this is a, an extremely good test. The answer should be true now and forever. Right. Uh, uh, well, it, it, well, it, it, at, least, it, it, at, at, at least it ought to be applicable in all similar situations. Otherwise, your reasoning is tendentious. Is that a categorical imperative? It is a categorical imperative. Well, it's the, it's the so-called Kantian universal. Yeah. And it really, it really is the non... It, it, it is the secular version of the Golden Rule. They hit me, kicked me in the ribs twice, hit me with an M16 rifle inside my face. And Henry Glover still in the car bleeding. And no one didn't check on him at all. That was the crudest thing a person can do to a man. Let him bleed to death in the car like that and show no, you know, no reaction to try to help him. They let him sit in that car too long. Last time I saw my brother when he took me out that car and put them handcuffs behind me. It's the last time I saw him. Edwards says he and Will Tanner were still in handcuffs when one of the police officers drove off in Tanner's car with Henry Glover still in the back seat. You know, them, them just it's been five years since Henry Glover died. Edward is still haunted by the experience. I, I tried to figure it out. I used to come out here and just sit and try to redo the whole thing, and I just can't, I just can't figure it out. I really can't. I wasn't going to do this, but, but since we're, we, we... 
That's the guy. That's the one that beat me. Hello? If everyone could get there to their seats and settle down so we can start the next session. Whenever he felt like it. It's been five years. You're sure this is I'm positive. I put my life on the line. That's the one beating me. I'll never forget his face. Um, if everybody could take their seats so we could get started. Sherman, then second in command of the NLPD SWAT team. Within the ranks of the police department, Sherman's status was almost legendary. A cop's cop, courageous and fearless. That was certainly the reputation he had earned in the first days after Katrina. Lieutenant Sherman was interviewed by Frontline at Haven School. We started here early Monday morning. We actually watched it from the We were watching pieces of the dome and roof come off. And uh, we started getting reports that they were already in both police officers and citizens in trouble as far as the officers. At that time, Sherman was considered a hero for his part in rescuing stranded flood victims. Myself and my brother took our personal fishing boats. There was people in their attics. They punched the windows out of the attic and they were screaming to us to come get them. He was relentless. Look at his face, his eyes, and you see the sheer determination, but you can also see the fatigue. Police officers in the first group, they will basically work in 24 7. Just being a constant sense of. Could everyone get seated, please? seats up front now since some of the speakers have left if people want to fill in. Um, we're going to try to get started now so if people could sit down. We're not on as tight of a schedule because Judy is going to make it to the news hour but we would still like to keep the time because we would all like to finish as quick as uh, but there are some empty seats in front here now that some of the speakers have had to leave. If you'd like to sit. Uh, so, are you guys ready? Pat, ready? So, welcome back. Our next panel is called Documentaries, Style and the Use of Archives. And Pat, after Heidi, will moderate. Pat is a university professor of communication studies at the School of Communication at American University in Washington, D.C. She founded the school Center for Media and Social Impact. Her books include Reclaiming Fair Use, How to Put Balance Back in Copyright with Peter Yazzi. She coordinates the Fair Use and Free Speech Project at the Center with Peter, Professor Peter Yazzi of the Washington College of Law. Pat, take it away. What a great pleasure it is. I feel like my entire life is passing before me as I look <laughs> around the crowd. Uh, but this, to be on a panel with these people is really extraordinary. Um, each of the people here uh, has been able to uh, not merely make great documentary, but create a future for a different kind of documentary than was ever possible on any other kind of television to be made. Um, and each of them has, um, uh, has contributed differently to, uh, to, to, to doing that and also in some cases supporting each other, which is really uh, doesn't, I don't want to know if I'm giving away secrets here, but that doesn't always happen in public television. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, and I've had the pleasure of working with some of these people as well because um, as Karen mentioned, uh, over the last decade, uh, Peter Yossi and I have been working with different organizations uh, to make fair use more available, particularly on, in archival ways, to, um, to makers and public uh, TV broadcasters, including some of these people, have really been uh, incredibly supportive and early adopters in being able to make uh, better use of material 
um, third party material to tell America's uh, story in so many different ways. I want to start first with Claiborne Carson. Uh, so Claiborne Carson is the founder and director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute. He um, was the senior advisor for Eyes on the Prize at a time when no one thought it could be made. Um, I would like to ask each of you, starting with Claiborne, to talk about that, what what, what were you, did you have in mind for these series? Each of you have, uh, have this experience, uh, this series that ended up really providing a template for how to do things in the future for filmmakers and had, it really hadn't been done. Well, to, to start out, one of the things that's so interesting to listen to the previous panel is that, uh, you know, I, just yesterday I was lecturing at Stanford to my students who were born well after all this had happened. And, uh, and, and I think that they were telling me about a period before I came on the scene. Uh, so I suddenly felt young, younger <laughs> in the sense that when um, I was, I got a call from Henry Hampton, and who should be here. I he unfortunately passed away, died way too early. Uh, but he was the vision, visionary of Eyes on the Prize. And, uh, I had just accepted an invitation from Coretta Scott King to edit Martin Luther King's papers. So it wasn't like I was looking for work. I, I, I realized that this was going to take decades, and it has taken decades, to, to edit and publish his papers. But what he was, he talked about his idea for a series. And I think one of the themes that I see running through all the discussions this afternoon is about democratization of information and the interpretation of history, of the way in which, if you think back to the days before PBS, before NPR, before the modern documentary style, most information about the past came from a few sources. If you saw a documentary, it was usually made by a, well, they didn't have a documentary, large-scale documentaries made by anything other than large corporations. A lot of them, uh, things like CBS reports, things like that, where they were done by the commercial networks. And what he was proposing was to do something very radical, and that is to get away from the notion of history as a master narrative told by a handful of people and written in textbooks and everyone kind of took that as authoritative. One of the first things he said is there's not, not gonna be any what we now call talking heads in Eyes on the Prize. That our job was not to come there and pontificate and you know, the, the four of us who were the senior advisors were all really young and I don't think we would have welcome that role in the first place. But what our job was to go and find how history was made during the 1960s, 50s, and 60s. And to go to the sources and, and find those people and let them tell the story of how they made history, not to interpret it. And, and that was a... It was a breakthrough. That was a breakthrough. Because mm -hmm. even now, when you look at documentaries, you see that many of them kind of go back to that notion by having the authoritative historian kind of give this interpretation that's going to guide you through. And, but there's this other story of these ordinary people who make history. And the, the real joy of doing it was that for us as historians, we were, we were in our own work. You know, the, my first book was on the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was not about King. It was kind of the counter King story. So I welcome that, that kind of an, an approach. And I think that that has influenced the documentaries that have been made since then, that many of them do take up that, that mantle of allowing ordinary people to tell the story of making history. 
And uh, from what you're telling me as well, not that, so one characteristic of this is ordinary people telling this, this story, and also in an oral history way. I mean, the, there was oh. so much rich oral history that had not, that, that would have escaped us forever that was done. And, and now it's interesting, because I can go into my classroom, as I did just this week, and use those um, interviews. I rarely use Eyes on the Prize in the classroom, but I use the interviews that we did for Eyes on the Prize. Mm -hmm. And often that works so much better in the sense of it'll, f I get it to the point where it fits what I want to talk about. If I want to talk about Coretta Scott King, for example, there's this wonderful interview we did, extended interview with her that maybe we used at most five minutes of it over the eyes on the prize. And, and I find that my students are so drawn to the, you know, just seeing her talk about ordinary things, you know, that what was it like talking to um, the President of the United States when your husband is in jail and you've never spoken to him before and he calls on the phone and your young son answers the phone and starts babbling away and you have to kind of get him off and say there's the president's there and uh you know i, I you know that kind of a story is going to get through and stick in the student minds of students far more than simply me giving a lecture about um, martin luther king and going to jail and writing the letter from birmingham jail Something else that I think it was so important about Eyes on the Prize in terms of standard setting was that I think it was John Else, but probably strongly supported by Henry and others, really arguing that every single image had to be exactly what you claimed it was. It yes. couldn't be like something that looks sort of like that, which was very common. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. There was no reconstruction. Um, we had to, and in fact, that was when the, there's a story actually that uh, kind of illustrates that. Um, we were interviewing Ralph Abernathy about the March on Washington. And he told this wonderful story about coming back after that day at the march. Um, I was there too, and you know, so I had a particular meeting when he t talked about coming back after all the people had departed and in the evening seeing the rustling of the you know the papers and all the leftover things and and then he says you know it was just the most beautiful day of my entire life and i remember david garrow um, kind of saying but it couldn't have happened that way why because we know where ralph abernathy was every <laughs> moment of that day yeah. And um, so we had this debate about whether to <laughs> trust his recollection mm. as opposed to our historical reconstruction. And uh, we decided to use it. We well, said it, history might not have happened that way. Maybe it should have. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll Fascinating. Imagining. Uh, well, let me, let me jump to, to David, if you don't mind. Um, who, who I, I remember when he was the brash young Australian who was here. South African. South African, sorry. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> you know, like Not us Australia. Americans, what's the difference? It's all in other countries. <laughs> anyway. We draw the lines. So. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> brash young South, South African here, here to bring us a whole new, new um, uh, format that was possibly too challenging for public television. You know, I'm a creature of, uh, I'm a baby of, uh, of public television. I walked into a public television station in 1973 in Huntington Beach as a young filmmaker from South Africa by way of London and the BBC. And, um, and I walked in and, and uh, volunteered, got my hands on the tools, that camera and that Nagra that were there and began working there. Peter McGee at WGBH found me there in 1977 and brought me to Boston to start a series um, called World, which was an international documentary series. And the idea was to do a series about the world as others see it. And that was this wonderful mm -hmm. idea. And I came to WGBH to find a place that was this extraordinary institution that was dedicated to ideas. And I had never been around anything quite like it. It was also that each of the people that were working in the different genres, from science to history to, to um, uh, uh, 
even, even Julia Child, who was in the back corner of our, our offices, um, were doing things because of, uh, they cared about the ideas. And uh, it was an extraordinary privilege, and it is to this day, this amazing privilege. That the reason there's a front line is because we were trusted with enough resources for long enough to, to work it out to try to figure out how to do the best work. And the privilege of being able to give them that resource and to say, how are you going to spend it and justify it? And if you can't make the best film you could make about this subject, then don't make it. And it was as simple as that. It wasn't me. It was all the talented people that I could go out and ferret out and bring to public television. I tried that out with Will. We did 60 films and along the way. But there was a moment when I sat in a in a, in a meeting at the Corporation of Public Broadcasting with a man who <laughs> must be remembered. Lewis Friedman was then the head of, of, uh, of programming the at program CPB. Fund. Yeah. And uh, he'd walked into it and he said he was inundated with thousands of proposals and he just couldn't sort through it all. And he made a decision to do three big strands. One was going to be drama and it became American Playhouse. The second was children's and it became Wonderworks. And the third was a news and documentary idea. And I walked in with World looking for a little bit of funding to do eight shows for the next season. And he made me sit down at his table with a sandwich and figure out what the budget for a 26-week <laughs> series would look like. And we, we counted it up to $3 million at the time in 1970, 1981. And we came up with that figure and said, well, we could probably do it for that much money. So, and he said, great, I'm going to put out a request for proposals. And he put out proposals, various people, including our friends at WNET, or proposed it, and we proposed it, and we got the money. And the guarantee was that we would have the money for three years if we could persuade the stations to match the money progressively over the course of the three years. It was a visionary idea, and he left us the freedom <coughs> to do that. And we made our mistakes, and we, you know, bumped our heads, and we did some good things, and we found some smart people, and slowly this idea grew. It grew out of simply that idea. So to Lewis, to Peter McGee, who found me on the beach in Huntington Beach and brought me to Boston, you know, are the people I thank for Frontline. That's what made it happen. And um, it really has been uh, as simple as that mm. and as complicated as that. And as, and, and Although the, Frontline has, a, it, it, it developed almost a, a brand. Well. That, that you really did put your stamp on a kind of documentary that. But I'd like to say that, that the films a, were a, very. a style of making documentaries. Well, I don't know. You see, I think there were lots and lots of different styles of films within them. There were observational films. There were repertorial films. There were investigative films. Uh, there were um, films like, uh, you know, Marion Marzinski's wonderful six hours called Stettel. You know, there, was, uh, there were uh, extraordinarily different films that came about. And I always thought that we needed to make the series that young, and older producers, reporters, and filmmakers would look at <coughs> and say, I can learn from that. And the people who'd come to me and say, how do you make these films? I'd like to get into documentaries. I said, just watch a lot of them and try to deconstruct them and look for the different ones that suit you for who you are and the kind of film you make. Because ultimately, these are works of authorship. And if you encourage authors and then encourage them because they do good work by giving them another film to make, then you begin to build a body of work over time. I mean, Frontline has, and you know, initially we, um, you know, Judy was anchoring the series after Jessica Savage in the first uh, first season. Um, but at a certain point, we felt like um, we would sort of take the extra time, and 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 uh, we began to use Will Lyman as a voice, and we made that strategic decision that you would hear this. There'd be something in the quality of the words or the quality of the storytelling that would say, aha, that's that different thing, that's that, that's that show. And so there was a value to that. Um, there are people who question that Will is kind of old-fashioned and uh, the patriarchy and all kinds of reasons that people would say we should be using other voices, and we do. 
but ultimately you needed to have some kind of connective tissue at times that would hold the string through the, through the sets of films. So you're arguing if you could have some of these marking features, yeah. then you could have a lot more freedom, artistic freedom in freedom, other areas. Freedom without it, but yet you'd still want to be something, something other than an anthology series. And the most important thing about it was there was going to be a work of journalism. It wasn't going to be an anthology series made by independent filmmakers who would come to us with films pretty much made and we would do, we would actually initiate and we would subject them to the rigors of an editorial process, which meant that they had, you know, that the journalism had to be transparent and we needed to be, go right deep into it at any point and be able to understand the source materials inside that film. And that was at the heart of Frontline. But Margaret wants to, <coughs> I, Margaret I, Train, American <laughs> Experience. Um, I also wanted to add that there is another binding agent in Frontline mm -hmm. and I think when I came to GBH I discovered this because I had come from CBS where I worked at um, uh, CBS Reports and then a couple of iterations of magazine shows. And uh, CBS Reports closed, shut down, because uh, TV Guide, do you remember TV Guide, an <laughs> artifact of the past, ran a front page story, I mean a, a cover story saying the documentary is dead. And this was in 1985, I think. That's when, you, that's when documentary was still a bad word. It was a bad word, mm -hmm. yeah. So everybody went scurrying, and I got a great job offer from WGBH, again from Peter McGee, who really needs to be mentioned as many times as possible because he, he sort of set the standards at WGBH. Mm -hmm. And um, they wanted, Peter and um, Judy Crichton was the original executive producer, wanted to do a history series, uh, but the binding agent in the history series was good storytelling. It had to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Narrative, narrative, narrative. We even constructed the documentaries in acts, which was something mm. that most documentarians had not been doing. Uh, you know, they, they had, um, on commercial television, you had a lot of documentaries that were like NBC White Paper and ABC, I forget what that series was called. And they were surveys. They were mostly surveys from the top down. They weren't stories. They weren't actual stories where you had characters that you could follow. Um, and I think uh, that, was a, that was an element that was emphasized at GBH and in particular mm -hmm. I know at American Experience because as we were talking before, you, you want to hear from as many people as possible who are as close to the subject as possible and then construct it very carefully to, um, to have a story arc. What happened then? What happened next? What happened after that? So you, you, let's let's point out then that public television is the the, the real innovator of this character-driven story model that now is standard yeah. expectation for documentary. Yeah, I think so because I mean I don't want to take the credit for it because it was I didn't invent the narrative style, um, but it was something that was embraced wholeheartedly by WGBH and they gave all of us the resources to figure it out because when you tell when you're in the process of telling a story you need time to figure out what the story is who the main characters are who the secondary characters are where the act break is what's going to happen next how to conclude mm -hmm. it and it, without being um, you don't have to tell the entire story you know because everybody used to agonize about what's yeah. left out well if you did your job properly no one would even notice that you left anything out <laughs> They would just, you know, you, our, our philosophy was just go narrow and go deep. Go narrow and go deep and get characters. But I, I did want to comment on something you said before about getting first-hand witnesses because I, I admired that in um, Henry Hampton's shop and mm -hmm. Eyes on the Prize, and I thought it was terrific. We had a challenge because our, our mandate was to tell all American history, you know, prior, we had to go back into the 18th and even the 17th century, and we were terrified. We actually avoided anything that was pre-archival because we didn't know how to deal with it at the beginning. And you can't find witnesses who are, we did a show, one of our first shows was on the uh, 1906 earthquake, San Francisco earthquake. We barely got a couple of people to, to make an appearance. And we sh as soon as we found them, we shot them immediately, you know, and put them in the bank. Because we didn't even know we were gonna go ahead with this story. Um, but it was a real stretch for us and we had to challenge ourselves to go back into um, the 19th century and even back into the revolutionary period. 
so we, what we've relied on since we're here talking about the archives is letters, diaries, first-hand accounts that could then be employed in many different ways to recall, maybe, it's, maybe it was the Donner Party. You know, I mean, there's no first-hand witnesses in the Donner Party. <laughs> one of our they most, each other. Uh, yeah, one of our most successful films. And what did we rely on? We relied on diaries and uh, and letters. So one of the things that is so, um, uh, I think, impressive about what what both of your series ended up, and all of your work in in, in documentaries did was to, I think, create a, a sense of trust among the stations for something that they had dreaded and feared ever since the days of NET, which was before there was a PBS, uh, and you know shows like the redlining show that made Nixon decide he should defund public broadcasting. So you, you sort of created um, a sense of quality, dignity, reliability, um, turnkey, and so on. Something else that is actually really interesting to me is that public television, in building upon that, has been able to actually foster a kind of, um, uh, uh, and as you describe it, anthology show for independent in voices as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, impressively, I have to say thank you to David Fanning for being so supportive of anthology shows as well as, as uh, these mm -hmm. executive produced journalism series. Um, and Steve Gong, uh, Stephen Gong, who is here from uh, the Center for Asian American Media, one of the uh, minority consortia of public tele, uh, uh, CPB, is uh, also a, a veteran independent filmmaker and somebody who, who uh, supports independent filmmakers and has also been involved in uh, creating archives that we can all draw on. So I'd, I'd love to hear, hear you talk a little bit about the, the um, filmmaking that goes to fuel the, the two big anthology series, POV and Independent Lens. Oh, and just like, let me say, board member of ITVS, yes. Okay. <laughs> well, um, actually, if I could, I'd like to make a reference to a, the panels we heard earlier because <clears throat> the seeds of the minority consortia, independent and diverse filmmakers, really goes back to the same era of the great society. So many of, of these entities were founded in the 70s mm. and it came out of both civil rights and in, in, in many of our cases, Hugo Morales touched on this also, on the changing, rapidly changing demographics of the country, which was starting to be recognized even then. You know, the Heart Cellar Act, the uh, Immigration Act was rewritten in 1965. And even though it would take the rest a generation, it has reshaped America. So in this time period I'm talking about from the 60s till now, the Asian American community uh, went from 1% of the population and now we're 6%, we're over 20 million and the fastest growing. Um, and Hugo mentioned the uh, statistics for the Latino community. So the premise that we all had as this <laughs> whole enterprise was getting underway was where were these voices of other communities for whom our presence in, in media overall was an absence or was a, one of stereotypes. So for Asian Americans, you know, in entertainment media, we are only, you know, the villains in war movies or we're houseboys or we're gangsters in Chinatown or laundrymen. And, um, and yet we have this inspiration of the civil rights movement to recognize how important it was for us to be able to participate in society. So the mechanism for us in the Minority Consortium, in the wisdom of uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, was to help ensure that there was a pipeline of programming by and about these new minority communities. But I, and we've been doing this between 35 and 40 years, all of us, the five uh, members of the organization. Uh, one of the things that I, one of the first points I wanted to make though, in response now to your question, was that we have learned something m deeper in this construct that it was important to uh, include the perspectives of people of color in telling uh, diverse kinds of stories, be they about history or social issues or, or even our cultural history. And I think at first we thought we were presenting authentic images that our own <laughs> communities could recognize. 
So one piece that's really important is you can't fully participate in the society unless in some ways you see yourself and your stories told in the society. The second point I think we came to understand relatively quickly after that was that these stories needed to be for all Americans though, and not just for our own communities. The Asian American community would be a good example because we're so diverse and so different in language and cultural backgrounds that in some ways, you know, you're an expert in no other culture in a sense, um, uh, in this construct of Asian America. But I would say in, in the recent years, and this is where I want to uh, end my thoughts on this, I think we now, where we are today in this question of really who is an American and what is it that makes America great, it's clear that I think in some ways we took for granted that there was an acceptance that diversity was an important and a key factor of the American experience. Um, but it is vital that we stand in for this notion of what this country can be and that it, it, we're not just about our racial stories. You know, diversity is within each of our communities as well. And I think that's the larger piece to reshift the way we all talk about what is our common history, the way we re-examine things. And, and I, I think we're still exploring what these different points of view mean, and, and it's a journey we'll all need to be on because we don't have the guide stone of a, you know, sort of white European male dominated through line of history. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody want to jump in before I? I, I, yes, I, I think one of the Clay. points I'd make is that mm -hmm. All of us, in some ways, are beneficiaries of the technological changes yeah. and that have lessened the cost and the, right. uh, the um, some would say even the skill level to get into <laughs> filmmaking, uh, so that it has become much, much easier to do what, uh, you know, like a, a film like Eyes on the Prize today, you could probably do it for much less um, money simply because the equipment would be so much less, the editing equipment, all of that sort of thing. And I think that looking forward into the future, what I see coming out of African American filmmaking is that proliferation is kind of pulling us in, you know, even within the African American community, now you have. Um, you know, gay filmmakers, uh, black filmmakers, who might be trying to describe that experience. You have so many, so much diversity within each of these communities that one thing I fear is that it's very difficult to get a sense, you know, right, right now, for example, I've been involved in more than two dozen documentary films about black American life, and most of it 20th century. And it seems like the pace of that keeps increasing. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and I think there is that, that, that concern that we're losing a sense of even the commonality of being black, much less being American. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's good, because otherwise you would not have a sense that these communities exist. But in terms of trying to get a sense of it, you know, for many of my students, I'm, I teach, right, in fact, I'll be teaching next quarter a course on black independent film. And I find that maybe one student might have seen uh, some of these fairly famous films, you know, uh, Charles Burnett, you know, you know, people who have really made major contributions. They haven't even seen early Spike Lee. Uh, so it's, uh, they might have seen Malcolm X, but that's it. So I, so I think that one of the, the problems we're going to have is that there are audiences, but it's going to be smaller and smaller rather than larger and larger. So let me, let me actually address the changing marketplace for documentaries, and I'd love to have any of your responses. So this is a point at which um, Netflix is busy giving people $450,000 <laughs> to make Virunga and, and uh, oops, sorry, and um, 
uh, is launching you know, entire lines. You've got um, Vice and Vulture doing instant video journalism. You've got BuzzFeed explainers um, apparently educating an entire new generation. Um, and uh, you've got cable channels just stuffed with wall-to-wall, -wall, something that looks sort of like maybe documentary. Um, and you have a, a legacy that's been built up largely through the hard work of public television that is that honors the notion of documentary as like a really authentic, true thing. At the same time as you have an enormous proliferation and, an, in, and a leaping into the marketplace of Netflix, Amazon, and so many more. So what's the role now of public television documentary? You know, it's surely not the only game in town. Uh, expensive, oh my god, compared to like almost any other uh, kind uh, source for documentary and uh, relatively slow compared to some of the others. What's, what's the role? No, no, no pressure, just. <laughs> but if you could provide us the answer in four minutes, <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, <clears throat> it's an enormous challenge. I think, that, I mean, one of the great challenges is gonna be, um, you know, how do you pick your way through all of this stuff and know what's true and what's trustworthy in, in, in the, People maybe don't, won't care about that as much. There's going to be an enormous amount of material that's out there in the world being produced in all these different areas, and uh, it's going to be manipulated and used because this is the most manipulative of media. And it's going to be, uh, and so we're going to have a harder and harder time trying to figure out what we can trust. I mean, this is so setting aside the, the question. The trust, trust brand. The trust yeah. brand. And the trust brand goes, goes to very expensive, uh, you know, high octane documentaries made with big budgets for HBO and for, and for um, Netflix and others as well. There are, you know, it's very easy to put your hand on the scale you know, in documentaries and to be able to manipulate them, this medium towards certain points of view. There's nothing easier than to kind of, um, you know, in Michael Moore's famous film of, you know, Fahrenheit 9-11, you know, the sort of, the use, getting Wolfowitz and being able to sort of get that sequence is, is fish in a barrel, it's not hard to do. It's very easy to be able to manipulate archival material and to use it in different ways, to lay a voice over it. So we have a deep worry, I think, behind all of this as to, where, as, as to what lies behind it and where do, you, where do you have trust. The only thing that we can hold on to is to say, I, we really believe that you can trust us. And, and the way in which you trust us is the body of work and the way in which we keep doing it, and also to make it as transparent as possible. So we made, for me, one of the great er moments in the life of Frontline was 1995. We'd just done a film on Waco or the inside story, and um, we'd done all these interviews um, with the major FBI, FBI guys who were part of negotiating with Koresh. We even had the audio tapes of the actual negotiations. And I kept saying, can't we put these audio tapes, in, make a radio show? And somebody said, you can put it on the web. What's that? 1995, we built- well, That was still Mosaic. Yeah. We, built, we built a website for Waco, the inside story, with that archival material. Plus, I said, well, can't we put the whole film on there? And they said, well, you can't do that yet. And, yeah. and, uh, and so then we put the interviews up. And all the interviews were uh, for these, were, 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 and that website exists today. People still actually write to us about that website from 95. And from then onwards, we began publishing all of the you know, edited, longer versions of the, of the primary source materials behind the front line. So that last week, the second film that ran of, uh, of Putin's Revenge, there were 65 interviews that are lying there, and a, a body of work that's both historically important. Now, that's not going to persuade the average person that's doing it that there is, you know, that they're going to go off and hunt through the interview but, materials. But you've, you made it but, transparent. But you've made it completely transparent, and somewhere that seeps deep into the culture, and that we can keep doing this if we raise the bar really high and hold to that bar, then we begin to hold on to who we are and what, why we remain the only place anywhere in the media culture that does that. And so the, that, that's our... That's our um, uh, okay, so that's your answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want to go, Margaret? Well, yeah, what I, what I just wanted to say is that you can, you can take that trust, too, and 
at, we all had to learn uh, using new platforms. And it was uh, challenging in many ways because we had been so schooled in the delivery of hour-long documentaries or in the case mm -hmm. of American Experience, six-hour-long documentaries or four-hour-long documentaries, which were big biographies of presidents. Um, so we had to learn how to use the material on YouTube and we had to learn podcasting and we had to learn all of the different platforms, mobile platforms, where we could deliver the same kind of content shorter, but this had the same, we hope, carries the same branding and the same uh, scrutiny that goes into an hour-long documentary and deliver it to your students who are not going to be watching hour-long documentaries. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless somebody leads them to it and shows them what the benefits are and well, what the range well, of interest is. And they're You're doing that. We're doing that. We're getting millions of viewers yeah. uh, through, yeah. through Facebook. I think both of you have raised the we're sitting in an archive. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we, um, I think for any documentary, one of the most important tasks is what do you do with all the material that you've brought together, especially yeah. the video material. And I think one of the most important decisions for Eyes on the Prize was to put it in an archive mm -hmm. where now you can go and uh, watch Roll the entire yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Coretta King interview or any other interview done during that time. And so Steve, we're going to run out of time. I want to make sure that we get your answer for um, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the answer for trust has been partly transparency, but it's also been partly brand. Uh, you know, to address us because we are PBS, we are American Experience, we are Frontline. Uh, and you're dealing with a different community who are uh, independent filmmakers of, uh, who, in your case specifically, Asian American filmmakers, but each consortia does in, in the, the series that showcase their work, anthologize all of this, all of this work which is very, very, very different. How, how do you address Clay's point about uh, uh, a, a centrifugal universe of information out there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, historically, uh, our stuff shows up into the system through a variety of ways, not through one particular strand, you know, one, one branded, although in recent times, in fact, we have a project that's going on American yeah. Experience uh, next May that makes extensive use of archival materials, and, uh, and we're also participating in the uh, archives of public broadcasting I'm really proud of. But to speak in general of this, you know, 100 titles a year that uh, collectively come from independent sources through ITVS, uh, uh, we put our stuff on POV that many of you may know about. Um, I, you know, it is a, it is a, I have optimistic going, moving into the future because this is what we all have to learn, how to incorporate many more points of view and many more voices in public broadcasting. And if you stay true to that, and it's absolutely mission-driven, what we heard earlier, it is the future. Um, and then make use of this incredible education network. I'm gonna set up the next panel for you. <laughs> PBS Learning Media, which we you know, put our materials on and, and make available to teachers. Um, that I feel very confident about the future of this enterprise because there are, there are thousands of tens of thousands of young makers who really want to speak uh, authentic stories that don't necessarily have to be in commercial media and be all about selling uh, a product or titillating people, or even in the best sense, just to entertain alone. I think there are so many issues that we share and public broadcasting, if it stays true to the mission, is that singular place. So we're gonna, uh, um, we've got like three more minutes, and I'd like to be able to use uh, them to talk to the issue you addressed, which is archives. And Clay has told us about, are, are, is, is Eyes on the Prize work in AAPB yes. somewhere? Yes, at uh, St. Louis. Um, and do you, is Densho? Do you want to explain Densho? Densho. There's many uh, wonderful things. Densho is an online digital archive of oral histories by the Japanese American community, and we have placed a number of our uh, collections, the Lonnie Ding collection, which she interviewed hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of uh, 442 veterans, you know, mm -hmm. from World War II, the Japanese Americans. We placed all those interviews on that source. But all of the uh, other kinds of works, they're going to go into the Library of Congress as part of uh, our uh, collections.
Fantastic. And, and you I, I would just recommend seeing the, 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 the Putin's revenge stuff. Um, um, it was done with, uh, with Duke, and it's uh, got the, the sort of state-of-the-art technology. 65 interviews, they're all video interviews. You can see, we both read it and be able to track the video at the same time. You can reach in and clip a piece out and share it. And um, it's, the, it's the most interactive, pro profoundly sort of uh, impressive uh, archive. So and are the, front line what, right now. fantastic. And in terms of AAPB, is there is there frontline material? I think it's due. I mean, Karen tells me it's in the pipeline. In the pipeline. We're, in the pipeline. we're on the way. The, the yeah. body of work to come in. Can, can I? I, I, I go, wanna, go. I, I just want to go back a little bit to something Colson had said about the appetite for documentaries. Um, I also am on the board of POV, the independent documentary series. And I am astonished. Every year we have an open call and we get more than a thousand entries mm -hmm. uh, from independent producers. And of those, it has to be called to like, we've got 18 slots. So that's, that's every single year. And even in the, after the, during the, you know, in the middle of the year when there's no entry date, we, you get, they get inundated with phone calls or they get tapes or they get, you know, um, um, uh, links to films that have been produced. So uh, there's something going on. It reminds me of the time when, you know, I was at CBS and they announced the death of the documentary. I don't think we can say that the, death is a, that the documentary is dying. I see quite the opposite. I see this hunger in young people made possible by technology in some mm -hmm. cases and also just this kind of uh, incessant, fervent curiosity that they have about their world. And they're making these films for practically nothing, and some of them are really terrific. So I'm optimistic. Um, uh, one, go, one word. I, I, I interrupted you, <laughs> two, two words that have not come up and that are really central in this is intellectual property. Mm. And I, I think that in general, scholarship and documentary filmmakers have not been aggressive enough in using fair use. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think that in part that comes from when, for a particular film that I was involved in, when it came to being shown on PBS, PBS required certain kinds of, of coverage, you know, for obvious reasons, yeah. legal yeah. reasons. And, and that forced them to go back and in this case, you know, have, a, have to take out um, things. So I think at, at every level, intellectual property issues have been crucial, mm -hmm. uh, not so much in terms of cost, but just uncertainty about use. And, and uh, people all being on the same page about what they regard as acceptable. Right. Yeah, which is, which is where the best practices have been somewhat helpful. All right, last comments, because we have like 15 seconds left. Go. Thank you. OK, <laughs> thank you. your 15 seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. Our next panel is going to begin. We're going to show some clips, which I hope you'll stay seated this time to watch. Um, it's on educational uses of public broadcasting, and it will begin, the panel will begin at 5.10, but we're going to start clips right now. And will the panelists please come and get mic'd? Thank you. The solitary arm of the unfinished Statue of Liberty had languished on Madison Square in New York for more than five years, when on May 6, 1882, on the eve of the greatest wave of immigration in American history, President Chester A. Arthur signed into law an extraordinary piece of federal legislation. It was called the Chinese Exclusion Act, and it was unlike any law enacted since the founding of the Republic. Singling out as never before a specific race and nationality for exclusion, it made it illegal for Chinese workers to come to America and for Chinese nationals already here ever to become citizens of the United States. 
fueled by deep-seated tensions over race and class and national identity that had been festering since the founding of the Republic. It was the first in a long line of acts targeting the Chinese for exclusion, and it would remain in force for more than 60 years. It continues to shape the debate about what it means to be an American to this day. Chinese Americans always have this identification with the founding principle of this country, so beautifully laid out by the founding fathers and so eloquently articulated in the Declaration of Independence and uh, in American Constitution. The Chinese identify with this fundamental principle of liberty, equality, and justice for all. And all men are created equal. Now, how can you say that this is a group of people who are biologically and culturally unfit to live a civilized life, to appreciate and practice American culture, political, and religious ideals. That's why I think a lot of Americans had a hard time to learn that the Chinese Exclusion Act really exists for 60 years. They couldn't believe it. The government did that. I, I suppose the picture of Nashville that most motivated me then, and still does, occurred in the mouth of a black woman who in the midst of a work summit in Nashville in the early part of uh, 1959, perhaps March of 59, a workshop in which we were describing what the issues are facing us today what the problems are, and what can be done about these. This woman, who I shall never forget, said, you men don't really know what life is like in segregation. We are the ones who shop. When we go into downtown Nashville, there is no place that we can stop with dignity and rest our feet. There are no restrooms that are, marked, are not marked either colored, period, or colored ladies. Um, there's no place that one can sit down and have a cup of coffee. So as we do your shopping for you, you're in oftentimes in your own offices and the like. But we're the ones who bear the brunt of the racism, of the segregation in Nashville. So... Did some of them oppose the sit-in movement? Oh, so absolutely. Are you they, teasing? Well, I just want to know specifically. Yes. You know, are, did did they, people oppose the sit-in movement? Yeah, absolutely. In the, in the black community, work. yes. The... Um, National Office of the NAACP told student chapters of the NAACP in Nashville, in Richmond, Virginia, in Knoxville, Tennessee, no, do not participate in the sit-in. It is not the way to do it. That was the National Office's policy in 1960. Um, so uh, right straight across the South, there were all sorts of people in the black community said that's not the way to go. That's one of the reasons why I said from the very beginning that the Montgomery bus boycott is as much a criticism of black leadership and black sort of adjusting to the evil 
as it was to the society as a whole. And that's why I said in 60s, in 1962, that the sit-in movement and the movement for social change was as much a, a word to the black community. The word to the black community was that we did not have to settle for passivity. We did not have to settle for this evil. And that each of us had a responsibility in whatever way necessary to begin to get liberated and begin to see that we had to organize and do it. The system cannot exist without our consent to it. Ben. So our moderator for our next panel on the educational uses of public broadcasting is the person who, during most of my tenure as the head of WGBH, held the purse strings, first <laughs> at PBS and then at CBB, uh, because she had the most important programming jobs uh, in those two institutions. Not simultaneously, I would say. Uh, Jennifer Lawson was the uh, executive vice president of programming and promotion services at PBS. Uh, and then was Senior Vice President for Television and Digital Content at CPB. And during uh, a little bit of time between those two, she ran the Howard University public station, WHUT. Uh, Jennifer has received numerous awards and honors for, his, for her work in public media. Uh, the Hollywood Reporter named her at one point one of the 50 most influential women in entertainment uh, in the world. So Jennifer, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Education is a fundamental element of public broadcasting. Public television was established as educational television first in many places around the country. The E in the call letters of many stations like WETA or KCET in Los Angeles or SCETV in South Carolina references education, and several of the 362 public television stations are licensed to universities, such as the one Henry just mentioned, WHUT at Howard University, or Arizona PBS, which originated at Arizona State University. Public television, together with public non-commercial radio, combined to serve as the most consistent and significant place for informal learning for listeners and viewers of all ages. We'll discuss public broadcasting's educational underpinnings, its legacy, and how the preservation of this content creates future opportunities. I have the privilege now of introducing our distinguished panel, and we have here Paula Absell, who is senior executive producer of NOVA and director of the WGBH Science Unit. NOVA has won every major broadcasting award, including the Emmy, the Peabody, the AAAS Kavli Science Journalism Award, and the DuPont Columbia Gold Baton, as well as an Academy Award nomination. Paula has also been personally recognized with numerous individual awards, including the Carl Sagan Award given by the Council of Scientific Society Presidents. NOVA is a favorite of teachers who make extensive use of its high quality educational materials and its website with popular short form videos and thought leader columns is one of the most popular on pbs.org. Lloyd Morissette. Lloyd is the, a co-creator of Sesame Street and a co-founder of Sesame Workshop, formerly the Children's Television Workshop, which produces Sesame Street. He was board chair of the workshop for 30 years and is now a trustee and chairman emeritus. He is also an experimental psychology scholar, a former vice president of the Carnegie Corporation, and the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. He was president of the John and Mary R. Markle Foundation from 1969 to 1998. He is currently a trustee of Public Agenda, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization conducting research to inform public policy issues. Catherine Ostrovsky teaches 
in the Department of History at Angelo State University in San Angelo, Texas. Catherine's areas of research and teaching include 20th century U.S. cultural history, sound studies, television studies, the history of race and ethnicity, and the history of media and communications. She is also working to preserve audiovisual and paper archival sources related to children's television. She has a doctorate in history from the University of Pennsylvania and her oral history of the 1970s through the sounds of Sesame Street has led to numerous speaking engagements and conference presentations. She is under contract with the University of California Press for a book on this topic. I'd like to start with Lloyd Morissette uh, and to talk a bit about the origins of Sesame Street. And I know that you were at the Carnegie Foundation and had a very good overview of the state of education in America at that time. And I would just, uh, I think it would be really useful if you would put Sesame Street in that, in the context of those times and tell us a little bit about what led to its creation. Well, those of you who are expecting Elmo, I'm not Elmo. <laughs> I think to talk about the origins of Sesame Street, you have to recreate in your minds the events <coughs> of, the, of that decade. And I'm going to list them here, and I'm going to read the list because I don't want to leave anything out. 1960, television may have given Senator John F. Kennedy the edge he needed to defeat Vice President Nixon in the first televised presidential debate. Kennedy wins the election by a margin of 113,000 votes out of 69 million votes cast. 1961, FCC Chairman Newton Minow makes his famous speech declaring that television is a vast wasteland. 1962, 90% of Americans own a television set ABC begins broadcasting in color. The federal government funds first funds, sorry, the federal government funds public broadcasting through the Education Television Facilities Act. June of 1962, President Kennedy federalizes Alabama's National Guard and orders Governor George Wallace to allow two black students to be enrolled at the university. Just recounting these events, uh, I find them very emotional. In January of 1962, Martin Luther King delivers his I Have a Dream speech. In August, more than 200,000 Americans march on Washington in support of civil rights. 1964, the 24th Amendment to the Constitution makes U.S. poll taxes unconstitutional. March 1964, President Johnson declares a war on poverty. He signs an Economic Opportunity Act in August and appoints R. Sergeant Shriver to head the new Office of Economic Opportunity. Again in 1964, President Johnson signs the bill enacting Medicare. The Great Society is underway. In August of 1964, Congress approves the Tonkin Gulf Resolution authorizing President Johnson to take all necessary measures to repel any armed attack against forces of the United States and to prevent further aggression. December of 1964, President Johnson announces a substantial increase in U.S. aid to South Vietnam to restrain mounting infiltration of men and equipment by the Hanoi regime in support of the Viet Cong. <clears throat> in 1965, January, in his State of the Union message, President Johnson outlines program for the Great Society that will eliminate poverty in America. In February, 
Dr. Martin Luther King is arrested in Selma, Alabama. In February also, Malcolm X is assassinated. Coincidentally, during National Brotherhood Week, June of 1965, Congress authorizes the use of ground troops in Vietnam. A complete ground offensive is underway, and the Viet Cong will collapse in a few weeks, said President Johnson's National Security Advisor, Walt Rostow. Not months, but weeks. 125,000 troops are in Vietnam. In August of that year, the Voting Rights Act becomes law. And in August of that year, the Carnegie Commission on Educational Television begins its landmark study of broadcasting. In 1967, Public Broadcasting Laboratory airs over national educational television. It is a Sunday night magazine program designed to showcase the relevance and importance of public television. We'll come back to that because that was much more important historically in public broadcasting than is generally recognized. In March of 1968, Pro President Johnson announces that he will not accept the nomination for another term. His presidency has become another casualty of the Vietnam War. In 1968, in April, Martin Luther King is assassinated. In 1969, regular national public broadcasting television program begins five nights a week. In November of that year, Sesame Street goes on the air. Now, as you can tell from my emotions, this was a very turbulent time. It strongly affected all of us, all of us who were alive. And it was out of that, in part, that Sesame Street was born. We started working on the idea in 1966. And the people that came to us to help, Dave Connell, for example, our executive vice president, uh, Joan Cooney obviously joined me in uh, the original idea. Uh, all of us were very affected by the events I've discussed. And so Sesame Street was in part born out of a belief in civil rights that we all had. The fact that it appeared on public television was somewhat of an accident. When we first started to raise money for it in 1966, <clears throat> Doc Howe had become Commissioner of Education and he had been formerly president, superintendent of schools in Scarsdale. And he was one of the first people we talked to about it. Uh, he, after some deliberation, overruled his staff and said that he would find $4 million to help us get on the air. So with that million, $4 million plus the million dollars that Carnegie had already put up, we had five million dollars. Lou Hausman was, was uh, Doc Howe's point person in liaisoning between the Office of Education and what was going to become Sesame Workshop. Lou came out of NBC television and he strongly believed that the program should be on commercial television. He said, where are the people going? They're on commercial television. That's where you have to be. So <clears throat> we took that advice seriously, and I met with um, NBC, CBS, Group W Broadcasting, and got very nice, uh, a very nice reception, but no money, <laughs> no airtime. The program was fully funded, but we couldn't understand, I couldn't understand in my na naivete why with a fully funded program, we couldn't have any airtime. 
Later, I realized, and I've realized it ever since, that the advertising part were interested in having those minutes sold that way. They wanted to raise money around the program, and they couldn't. So the commercial broadcasters turned us down, and just at that point, the Public Broadcasting Act had been signed, and public broadcasting needed programming. We needed airtime. It was a... I won't say it was made in heaven, but it was certainly made <laughs> by, by an accident of history. So the, the things that made it possible, in addition to the ones that I've already cited, are that the people essentially who, who created the climate to accept the idea of a children's television program were all in their place. John Gardner had been my boss at Carnegie, was a good friend. Doc Howe ha had also become a friend. Other people who were not directly uh, involved in the origins, but created the climate in Washington that made it possible, Newton Minow was one. He's been a friend the rest of, my, rest of his life for me. Henry Geller, whom some of you may remember, was an ardent fan of the public's use of broadcasting and not giving it away free to commercial broadcasters. Uh, the other person I'd mention whose name has already come up is Doug Cater. Doug Cater was Lyndon Johnson's special assistant for education. He shepherded the Public Broadcasting Act through, through the process of getting it to Congress, and he was also a great friend of the kinds of things that we were trying to do. Joan Cooney had been at uh, NBC, and then she had been at Channel 13, where she was a, a commercial, not a commercial, a documentary producer, and had had three good documentaries to her name. So essentially, not only had the climate of opinion in the country been um, fertilized, I'll say, by the events of the 1960s, but the particular people I've mentioned were all interested in the public's use of public facilities and public education. They are what made the idea become possible. I think I'll stop there, Jennifer. Terrific. Terrific. Now, thank you. And Paula, your work exemplifies informal education. You've helped popularize and demystify science and science education, and you've given exposure to some scientists that has made them as popular as rock stars. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Brian Greene, I mean, you know, it's easy to go places and people go, oh, wow, Brian Greene, string theory, <laughs> you know, and so it's, uh, and then you've sh also shown us women and people of color in the sciences routinely throughout your series. With NOVA, what's the, the origin? How did we get from there to here? That's good. I, I, first of all, I just want to say I'm just awed to be sitting next to Lloyd because um, my daughter Natalie is here with me today. And I just can see in my mind's eye, and this makes me emotional. <laughs> And she and her sister as little girls would be sitting on that couch every single day at 4 o'clock, their thumbs in their mouth. A bomb could have gone off in that room, and they would not have moved. And what they learned from Sesame Street, way beyond the importance of the letters, the lessons about life, about ethics, about morality, about how you treat other people of all different kinds, even if they're not familiar to you, and now, as everyone knows, I have a grandson. <laughs> and he watches Sid the Science Kid and the other, also Sesame Street and the other programs on PBS. So as well as being a content generator, I'm a recipient <laughs> of all the good things that PBS does for kids and educationally. And it's just, it really, it's just overwhelming. I feel so fortunate to be a part of this. Now on to NOVA. <laughs> so 
education is in NOVA's DNA. We've been producing content for teachers and students for as long as we've been on PBS, and that's 44 years, which is kind of an eternity in television. And now I have to mention another man that I think is a really great person, and that is Michael Ambrosino, who started NOVA. And Michael just had, absolutely. Michael just had a really good idea, very simple. His idea was science is not a collection of facts, it's a story. And if you tell the story with right, with characters and with visuals, then people will watch and they will learn, but they will enjoy. And it will change their opinion about science and make, help them to understand what an important part of our lives and what an important, I would say, cultural institution, that it is really a thrill to get a better understanding of our world. And Michael always knew that, um, that it was very important for NOVA to go out to teachers as well, and that they should have supplementary materials that would help them use NOVA in the classroom. So for years and years and years, we made teachers' plans, um, which had all sorts of suggestions and tips and activities for the classroom. But teaching changes, education changes, and technology changes. And now it began as Teacher's Domain at WGBH, went to PBS as PBS Learning Media, a fabulous digital library, the central hub for all the educational content produced by all the PBS brands. And it now reaches more than two million educators, which is amazing. And WGBH is the STEM lead for PBS LM. And NOVA itself has contributed more than 900 resources, mainly video clips, lots of animation, and these are all contextualized with, um, with teaching standards and discussion questions and background essays. And we promote these um, clips really rigorously to teachers at conferences. We also create new digital content like Nova Labs, which is a platform of science games and interactives that uses real scientific data. And these are actually, they were originally designed for teens to use at home and you know, not, not as an in-school activity, but they turned out to be really popular with teachers which, um, which use them all the time and actually assign them to their students to do as homework. So to date, that platform has engaged nearly more than four million unique viewers. And our education lab, and I just find this amazing, is NOVA's most visited page. So I, I find that amazing. We have an upcoming two-hour program on black holes, um, which is hosted by astrophysicist Jana Levin. And to go with that, we create an iPad app that invites players to navigate the cosmos by hurling stars at various celestial objects, <laughs> kind of like angry birds, but it's for the universe. But that's, that's our, what we call our educational content, whether it's informal or formal. But science is for everyone, and so is NOVA. And so, of course, I love it when people tell me, oh, I went into science or engineering as a result of watching NOVA. But really, we want to stoke curiosity and excitement about science in people of all ages. So we have a very rich historic archive that chronicles scientific research over four decades. If you want to know the origins of genetic engineering or how artificial intelligence got started, you know, you can really, we've been covering that throughout the 20th century and now 21st century on NOVA. And at any given time, we have about 100 full-length programs available to everyone to watch online on pbs.org for free. And we also reach out into the community. We've created a coalition of science um, cafes more than 400 of them. And we ourselves, every month at WGBH's studio at the Boston Public Library, we hold a science cafe for anyone who wants to come. And these science cafes are usually held 
at um, non-traditional settings. They're a chance for people to actually interact with real scientists. And it's really kind of amazing to know how many people in their daily life don't get a chance to really meet a scientist and talk to them. And I think that's why people get very wrong ideas about scientists and about science. And so, and people really enjoy these settings um, when they're held. And an example of this is we also, of our reaching out into the community, is for our program School of the Future, which actually looked at the issue of educational equity and what kinds of new techniques and te technologies can be used to help equalize things. We organized 293 community screenings at K-12 settings, at community organizations, and really all over the place. And people came and they really engaged in the discussion of how education can be made better for everyone. And finally, and, and this really touches the point that you made, Jennifer, we want people from all backgrounds to appreciate the importance of science in our lives and the crucial role that science literacy plays in a democracy. And now CPB, with their help, we've been able to develop short form video that explains the science behind many of the stories that are dominating the news cycle. If you, um, and embedded on all of our work is the mandate that we have in public media to reflect the diversity of all people and experiences in our country. We are 100% committed to increasing diversity in front of and behind the camera by actively cultivating both producers and scientists of color. And I really invite you to take a look at any current NOVA and you'll be able to see what we're doing. But equally important to that, we're actually expanding the scope of the stories we tell, focusing more on the ways that science impacts social justice. In our episode last spring, Poison Water, about the Flint, Michigan water crisis, is an example of that with all its associated digital and educational content. And I also believe that this, <coughs> excuse me, really illustrates the importance of education being embedded in a production unit like NOVA. Our education director, Ralph Bouquet, who taught biology in an inner city high school in Philadelphia and can really share that experience with all of us, he has a leadership role in our unit. And not only does this integration drive many of our initiatives, but the lessons that we learn in educational and digital and broadcast go back and forth, and they are all enriched by this integration, and that helps us better to serve the American people. Thank you. Catherine, you've studied children's television and Sesame Street in real depth. <laughs> and that you've learned a lot about the role of the series in educating preschoolers, but through your work and through the particular angles that you have approached Sesame Street, you've learned a lot about our society as well. And could you share some of your observations with us? Yeah, I think I'm here to represent the generation that did grow up on PBS. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my education, of course, started with Sesame Street and is continuing with Sesame Street through my graduate school and now <laughs> in my teaching. Um, I just never stopped watching. <laughs> um, so, so I've been asked to talk about public broadcasting as history, and that's, and that's why I, I use Sesame Street as an historical source. Um, but so much of public broadcasting, of course, can be used as historical sources. And the way that we often think about that is that public broadcasting recorded our past. Um, the public affairs shows, the talk shows, recordings of great performances, um, are now a, an archive of our history, and that is true. But as a scholar and as a teacher, I am more interested in thinking about the ways that public broadcasting is our history because it is a forum. It is a vehicle, a tool through which we seek to understand our past and our present and shape our future. And I think this is a theme that's been running throughout all the panels this afternoon, the theme of democratization and interactivity, um, so this happens um, from both angles, uh, from the producers as well as from the 
audiences, so from the producers, the way that they approach their programs. Jim Lehrer doesn't just report the news, he analyzes it. Dick Cavett doesn't just ask boilerplate questions of celebrities, he engages them in a conversation that can take any turn. Um, <laughs> even uh, almost coming to physical blows. <laughs> Um, Lloyd Morissette and Joan Gans Cooney did not just use television to teach letters and numbers. They designed a program that reflected the cultural sensibilities of the urban minority children that they hoped to, to serve. And they built the program to be, a, uh, to be able to evolve and to uh, be responsive to society's changing educational needs and cultural needs. So all of these programs are, they're not just series of short conversations or presentations, rather they are decades long conversations between producers and audiences about issues that matter to us. So public broadcasting creates, in particular creates a really rich record of these discussions of these long conversations because its funding comes from the government and from philanthropic foundations um, and viewers like you. Um, they <laughs> producers and stations constantly have to articulate to their audiences and to their funders what they're doing, why they're doing it like that, and what impact it's having. This creates a paper trail that is amazing for historians. Um, because public <laughs> broadcasting is for the people, and, um, and it's mobilizing this technology not for advertisers, but for, for the audiences themselves. The audiences, educators, social activists have through, a, through the years felt that they could and should make their voices heard in, this, in, in public media as a collaborative effort to improve programs um, or to use public broadcasting as a tool for broader social change. So they, they do talk back to their televisions as, as uh, Nicholas Johnson suggested. Um, so in the case of Sesame Street, for instance, the producers and the audiences agreed that the show should provide models for ideal community interactions. But as Lloyd was just talking about, there's, there's a lot going on in the 60s and the 70s. There's civil rights, cultural pride movements proliferating and fragmenting in the 1970s. So all of these people who are invested in Sesame Street in some way don't agree on what that ideal community should look like or sound like, how those people should behave. So cast members, staff, parents, critics, advocacy groups like the National Organization of Women and the UCLA Chicano Studies Center had ongoing discussions about characters, how characters should speak, what musical guests to feature, um, how to represent and celebrate diversity without perpetuating stereotypes. Um, and there was no easy answer. And, and luckily, Sesame Street is a variety show, so they could sort of do, experiment with all these things um, at the same time and see what worked. Um, so, but this engagement with social issues also happens long after the programs first air. Um, and it's, it has become cliche to say that documentaries bring the past to life, but um, they certainly do in my classroom, not just metaphorically, but um, th these programs often have the power to continue the traditions that they discuss. The first episode of Eyes on the Prize, for example, it's called Awakenings, and it shows how media coverage of the lynchings, uh, lynching of Emmett Till and the sham trial that allowed his murderers to go free led to a uh, published, uh, public consciousness about the conditions of Jim Crow and it inspired civil rights actions. Watching the documentary itself is a consciousness-raising experience for my students. And there is no more powerful demonstration for why so many people risk their lives for civil rights. One episode of the American Experience series on Latino Americans covers the 1968 walkouts through which Chicano high school students took control of their education and sought to understand their place, uh, the place of themselves and their families in American history and American society. And for one of my students a couple of years ago, 
she had heard about the walkouts from her mother who had participated in them. But to see uh, those events depicted on national television, in a US history survey class, uh, did, did the same thing for her. It inspired her to take her own education into her own hands and, um, and figure out her place in society. Um, so uh, public television, I mean, we're here talking about preservation, public television and uh, radio need to be preserved, not just because they have recorded our history, but because they continue to be the material that we use every day to engage with our past or our future, um, shape our future, so. No, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. No, I, I think your comments underscore uh, what has been said, too, at some of the other panels about the incredible importance of the material, not just during the time that it is broadcast, but its archival value into the future. Uh, before we come back to preservation, I'd like to go back to Lloyd for a quick question that relates to your background in psychology, too, and that is that, uh, uh, for example, a national study recently revealed that 50% of American children under the age of 18 have experienced a traumatic event, such as witnessing violent acts or experiencing natural disasters. Last month, Sesame Street, Sesame uh, Workshop launched an initiative to help children cope with these traumatic experiences. And Sesame Street puppets have often in the past been used to help children talk about uh, events like a death in the family or a divorce. And when you and Joan were starting Sesame, did you envision this kind of therapeutic role for the series in its early days or did that is that something that evolved? It evolved. In the, the early days, the question we were tasked with answering, can television teach anything? <laughs> we had to answer that with a positive in order to gain more funding. <laughs> so the, <laughs> that, that was the, uh, the hard, hard work of it. So initially, we concentrated on things that were taught in school, or it needed to be taught in school, letters, numbers, so on, and could it be easily measured. Those were the things that we were really trying to look at. And fortunately, the study that came out showed that people that watched more learn more. With that start and with the confidence that we were going to be able to continue once we got a, a second season's funding, we then began to broaden the curriculum to take into account some of the things that you're talking about. Although the, um, the real change probably came much later, the Military Families Project was probably the most important change in that regard. And now, of course, as you, you mentioned, uh, the traumatic events, abuse, Autism would be another example where we would not have been able to do that initially, but as the program evolved, we have been able to do more of it. Great. I, I'd like to address that sure, issue please. of can television teach anything? Because I, I think it's really an, a, an important question. It's very important for NOVA in a way because part of our, you know, I, I, we're always discussing, was we were, you know, 40 years ago and we're still discussing it, is, is our primary function to educate or to entertain. Mm -hmm. and we're always kind of talking about how you blend those two things. But when you think back to your own science classes and how the teacher was always talking about things that you couldn't understand what he or she was talking about because you couldn't visualize it. You had absolutely no frame of reference for it. And I, and I think this it's one of the huge values to PBS Learning Media and, and to their, their whole, their huge STEM collection because it helps, it provides visuals. So when you're talking about a volcano and what's going on, the molten magma under the earth, I mean, who really knows what that means when you're a kid and you've never lived near a volcano and you've never seen one. But here you can have an animation and it can be contextualized 
by your teacher because there are, you know, the, it, the, uh, the archive helps. So I really, I just think in terms of science, visuals are just so important. And they also help both kids and everyone take the world from another perspective, the design to show you things that you can't see for yourself. And that, in a way, expands your world. And that, to me, is just really one of the, of the benefits of the educational uses of our material and of the fact that we are fortunate enough to be able to produce these things and have the resources to do so, even though it's always a struggle, um, in the first place. And that you've had, in, in many cases, the nature of your funding from places like the National Science Foundation or the funding that you've received for at Sesame uh, Workshop has received has required rigorous um, evaluation, right, and, and testing as a part of the proving that it has this educational benefit. Oh, rigorous evaluation. <laughs> and costly. Okay. But it's not, you know, now one thing that the National Science Foundation and actually a lot of other funders are going, are going off to is they want you to use your material not just to evaluate it to see if it's any good, but they want it to add to the body of learning of how people learn from the visual right. media, whether whether they get more out of an hour-long documentary, whether they get more out of short-form video, what the difference is, what the difference is in their attitudes towards science. So we're really accumulating with some of our projects, and we're working with academics on, on this because we're not, I mean, I'm a TV producer, trust me, I couldn't e begin to figure out how to do these projects, but to use them to really understand the fundamentals of science learning. And it's very gratifying that our material can be used for that. Right. Now, Catherine, you had mentioned to me a little earlier that in addition to the audiovisual materials being so incredibly important, that there are other resources like the kind that Paula just mentioned or the notes from the creation of a program, work that producers do that they might just think is real throwaway, mm -hmm. that some of that has archival value for scholars like you? Uh, yes. Um, I, I've been using uh, the Sesame Street's uh, research notes too. I'm struck by the parallels between um, the, the studies and the outreach that Nova and Sesame Street have had. They're also a paper trail for learning about how we learn from media, learning about what uh, the history of the discipline of psychology or education or whoever's doing these studies um, is. And they're also fun for me to look at from a humanities perspective because you do have certain things that you're testing for your show but that doesn't mean that's all we can learn from that data. So I go in and read it from a, from a historian's point of view and find completely different information about, um, for instance, cultural, cultural differences uh, between the Spanish-speaking and English-speaking kids uh, about how they're responding to music, which is not what was being tested. They were, was, it was how they were uh, learning the Spanish language. But there's more information there than is used in, in, in your studies. So your studies have broader impact beyond what you're doing with them. And as we talk about these uh, of preserving content and materials from public media and these documents, I just also want to mention that we probably haven't represented fully enough the broadest range of public media because there's also culture and the arts and that uh, there is so much, I think, in terms of performance program, cultural programs that are created by producers both at the national and local level, and so I also want to, to bring that into the discussion, as well as uh, public media creating a really, really robust archive of local content. Most public media stations and public radio really do an incredible amount at the local level. And so there's a, a wealth of material and a history of communities that's being created there as well. Now, we have talked, though, about reaching 
the youngest uh, viewers, and that we've also talked about adults in many ways, uh, although I must say that you're going far beyond adults when I look at uh, slimy, gross science programs that <laughs> Nova is a part of. Gross science, yes. Right, gross science or some of your other... Call it what it is. Yeah, or some of your other programs that are, you know, what makes you vomit, you know, it's like... <laughs> So I can I mean, it's your body, you've got to understand it. Yeah, right? so I can imagine you attracting a much broader age range, but that has been one of the challenges, I think, that has plagued public media for a number of years. And I want to start with you, Lloyd, and just going back to the question of, did Sesame, did the workshop, Sesame Workshop, as the children's television workshop, what efforts were made uh, in these sort of earlier years in trying to go beyond preschoolers and to reach the preteens and teenagers? Uh. Well, as Paula has mentioned, in producing a television show, you have to attract the audience as well as teach them something. And so Sesame Street was designed in the beginning. I need to start that again. The viewing conditions in 1969 are extremely different than they are today. In 1969, typically families had one television set, the family watched together, and the parents could act as an intermediary between what was on the television set and what the child learned. You say, Johnny, did you see that A? Or Johnny, take a look at what's coming up next. It's going to be like, and that gets Johnny's attention to something on the set that you want to teach about. Uh, now, I think at the, I saw that maybe 90% of adolescents and above have smartphones. Mm -hmm. Television south sets are numerous and often the child at whatever age, two or three even, controls the set himself or herself. So the problem of, of maintaining an audience and know what audience you're really trying to reach is much harder. I don't think we figured it out yet. But we certainly had the idea from the beginning that the adults had to be attracted to the program as well as the children. I used to like to sit 4 o'clock. I was pretty tired. Yes. Sit there and we'd watch Sesame Street. It appealed to adults as well. I mean, I felt like there were two levels that it was there operating were. on. Laugh-In, which some of you may remember, was a very important precursor to what we did. We use a lot of the laugh-in <laughs> techniques in, in the early, in the early yeah, shows. Yeah. No, and I think it very definitely did that. One piece that I remember is, uh, I think it was Patti LaBelle singing, I love my ex, I miss my ex. And there's, of course, the letter X on the screen. But the look in her eyes suggested otherwise. <laughs> So it definitely, it seemed as if it was very consciously designed to it was. to no work for about that. both yeah. levels. And the writers particularly enjoyed doing that. They liked to write one-liners, one and kids didn't get it, but the adults did. Yeah. But in, in terms of, of the ages, yes, I mean, we all worry in, um, in public media about an aging audience. I mean, it's like discussed constantly, <laughs> and we're sweat it constantly. We try to really figure it out how we can appeal to younger people. Well, one thing we find is that we have a very different audience online, that the audience online is much younger. And so the idea is that the audience online, we do know that they love to watch our shows on their computer. They love short form video. I guess that's the whole thing about the attention span. I don't know. but. Um, but they also like to watch our short form videos. And if we take them off, they, oh, our lawyers are right there. But I have to say, in two minutes, they're pirated and put on YouTube. And you take them down, and they go back up. It's like that pop-up, you know, whack-a-mole. It, it is really amazing. So they really, so I think this is a key to us. Young people we know do not have television. They don't watch television that much. They watch on their phone. They watch on their computer. The hope is that they will, um, youngsters do grow up, and very often they get, have families and their life changes and it starts to, um, and they start to realize the value of public media and they start to join their local station 
And I, I think that there is, maybe I'm just an optimist, <laughs> but I think that they, I think if we can keep reaching out to them and hold them close to us by various different forms of what we do, we will migrate them in a direction that many of them will be watching our programs. Maybe that's just optimistic. I think there's an untapped potential for that middle audience between children and adults. Um, certainly my students, they're adults, but they, <laughs> they uh, one of the things that I try to do with the documentaries is that I show in class is to not just show a documentary, but do something with it. And there are a few documentaries that tell us something about the historical profession. My freshmen are watching A Midwife's Tale because I'm not in class today. Um, and my seniors are watching American Experience documentaries. But um, I, I, you, you can use these documentaries to teach about narrative structure, since they use narrative structure we just heard. Um, you can teach them about media literacy, which I think is a really important skill that they are not coming to college with these days and we need it more than ever. Um, so there, there are creative ways to, to use these programs beyond simply the formal education or, or informal education that they were designed for. Jennifer, <coughs> you haven't said anything about it, but the title Preserving Public Media has two meanings. Mm -hmm. It means archivally, and it also means continuing it. Yes. And <coughs> we do not now have Newt Minow at the FCC. We don't have John Gardner at HEW. And I would think that there should be a considerable amount of concern about the enduring health under the current auspices of public media. Well, I thought that it was really uh, quite heartening to hear with some of the earlier panels who addressed that. I thought it was really quite heartening to hear their level of optimism about public broadcasting and its future and its potential in that way. But I welcome your thoughts about this. Well, I, I think I, I was going to say one thing is that I think, you know, we just talked a minute or so about age. I mean, the, the hope is that the American public will demand the preservation of public media. You know, we have to have our fans out there. They are our, our, our biggest asset. And I think many of you in this room will remember um, under a few years ago, decades ago, I don't even remember when it was in the 90s, when public media was really threatened. And people wrote letters, millions of letters, and said, no, absolutely not. You cannot take this away from us. That is our preservation. That is our guarantee. So the concern I have is, yes, indeed, we want to expand and get younger people. Listen, I love my older viewers. Keep watching. <laughs> you oldies but goodies, I love you. OK, don't stop watching. People are living longer and longer, so it's great. We do want to get younger people, but we also want to get, and I know this is near and dear to your heart, we want to get more diversity, not just because we're ethical people, but also because that is our survival. The American demographic is changing, and we have to change with it. And my job is to really find ways to and choose topics that show people science belongs to you, not just to me, not, listen, science has been white. We all know that. It's, it's changing. It's bringing many more minorities into it. We used to tear our hair out to try to find minority scientists to put on the screen. Now, it's really, you know, it, in some fields it's challenging, but in many it's really not hard at all. That's great. So one way is to really make sure that we have scientists of all different colors and all different backgrounds on the screen. Another way is in the choice of topics, right. that we have to choose topics that, that take into account people's concerns. 
And so hopefully, this is not something that's going to be accomplished. We're not going to expand our percentage of minorities from 9 or 10 percent to 25 percent overnight. But my hope is, is that if we do it right, we tell good stories, and we're much more inclusive in topic choice and people, that people will respond by watching. And you know, when we took our, our show, Poison Water, to Flint, and we showed it in Flint, and you know, that community, you know, we just, it was, the reaction was just so amazing that this group of people who were, these people were citizen scientists. They did not wait and rely on scientists to come in and do it for them. They figured out more than the scientists in a lot of the agencies what was going wrong with their pipes. And then to see themselves reflected in a documentary, how they had taken a role in their own survival and the survival of their children, I think they were really amazed. And I think it gave them a different feeling about public media, that it became theirs. And you know, it's not easy. There are not zillions of topics that you can do it with, but I think it's imperative. I want to come back to Lloyd's uh, you know, really uh, appropriate question about preserving public media uh, for the future. And, uh, but before I do that, I want to just also get your thoughts. And, you know, we have just a quick minute. I want to get your thoughts about uh, beyond the screen because we've talked about public broadcasting and we're talking about broadcasting and I know that all of you are aware of public media and, and you do your work on so many other platforms as well. And I just would welcome your speaking about the importance of public media on those additional platforms. I think that you've spoken to that, you know, uh, you know quite in a very articulate way, Paula, about the, what NOVA has been doing, but other thoughts about beyond broadcast? Uh, well, we get, we now get an enormous uh, number of hits on YouTube where we've provided a, a lot of clips. So that's a reuse of something that's been done before, but it's a very useful one. Um, thoughtful curation of the things that are available really helps the professors who are at n most colleges and universities that um, have a lot of students and not a lot of time to prepare outside of their fields in teaching. So I would, I would say, yeah, it's, re it's extremely important. So the thoughtful curation comes in places like with PBS Learning Media, yeah. I assume, where then there's already the thought given to what age group, what level, what the topic is, mm -hmm. all of these. If there are any nicely tagged and everything. Yes, so, tag <laughs> properly tagged, and if there Key are words. <laughs> if there are any interactive things that can go along with, um, I, I there used to be an interactive game of uh, of pretending you were in the gold rush and taking on a character and seeing if you survived. And it took about two minutes to play and it went along with the documentary for the gold rush. I can't find it anymore. I hope it's, hope it's there. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it may have moved or it may have just been old, um, but, and that's, that's of course a problem. You have to ask the 10 year old to find it for <laughs> you. They <laughs> won't have any, any problem at all. So as a final question, just to come back to this, this all important point, uh, and, uh, we're at the end of this wonderful day and all of these, these really very, very rich panels. Uh, what about preserving public media for the future? I, I would worry most about just not having the budget go up. I mean, the costs are going up for everything else. And there, are, there are a lot of things that the budget can be used for and we just keep it the same. So it's a, in my view, the strategy is slow starvation. Well, I don't want to starve. <laughs> I, I, as I always say, I'm on the spending side, <laughs> and I like that side. But here's is what I worry about, and you just mentioned something I think is very important, which is the non-broadcast aspect of series like the ones that we do. And I know my. Uh, documentary friends from the previous panel will really appreciate it, news and, and all of ours. When we started our website in 1996, we just figured, okay, we'll just take the same stuff and we'll put it online and maybe we'll, you know, put a few 
you know, it, 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 it felt like it was just going to be a free addition to NOVA. Now it's its own mouth to feed, and it's getting to be a gigantic <laughs> mouth. And, um, and so the question is, and it's so important because it is a way to attract so many people who are not going to turn on the television set. And I think we certainly find it's much harder to raise money for digital than it is to raise money for broadcast. So I think that's something we really have to have to figure out and figure out with the foundations and the other funders that have supported public media in the past because this is the new world. This is it. Um, oftentimes academics and broadcasters and archivists live in different worlds so I think we need more events like this to bring all of us together <laughs> and, and that's the first step, conversations like the one we've had today. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. We, we have one more element to this panel. Uh, we're going to let Newt Minow have the last word. But uh, before we do, uh, first of all, my thanks to all of you and, and to you, Jennifer, uh, for the work on this panel. Uh, I hope you have found this afternoon as fascinating as I have, uh, being with these founders of public media and creators of some of the most iconic and, uh, and important content in public media. And I'd be remiss if I didn't take us back at the very end to the other meaning of the word preserve and to talk, just say a few words about the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. Although I can't be quite as articulate as Catherine was, I think. <laughs> but we, this is really the uh, archive of our times. Uh, not just our national times, as you've heard, as Jennifer alluded to, but also the times of our communities, uh, geographically around the country from coast to coast, um, and culturally. And believe me, uh, local commercial broadcasters have not been able to preserve their archives. Uh, it's too, it has been too expensive for them. It doesn't, it, you know, they had to reuse those tapes. Uh, or couldn't spend the, the staff time given news cycles, and especially now given news cycles, uh, endless news cycles. Uh, so uh, commercial broadcasters really have not, with a few exceptions, been able to preserve their archives. It just wasn't their business plan. So it's more important than ever that, commercial, that public media preserve its archives, and it's also a very critical part of our mission that we make that archive accessible. It's been part of the core mission of public media from the very beginning that we make our work available to everyone, no matter where they are, no matter what their means are, their ability to pay, and especially in this universe now where almost everything is behind a paywall in media elsewhere. So I'm very proud of the progress we've been making uh, through the American Archive of Public Broadcasting to put these works up online and make them accessible. Uh, I want to, uh, as we close, make a special thank you again to the two co-heads of the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. Alan Gevinson in the back, his hand is up there, for the Library of Congress. And Karen Cariani from WGBH right in front, who shared the podium with me. Uh, following Newt's last clip, which is, I think you'll find fun, um, <laughs> there is a reception in that room right over there. So we thank you again for joining us and we welcome you to the reception. But first, the last word from Newt. A, a Republican, Dean Birch, who had been Senator Goldwater's campaign manager of the presidential election of 1964, and then chairman of the Republican National Committee. Uh, Dean and I were friends. We had served on a bipartisan commission together. Uh, he had he turned down President-elect Ni President Nixon's offer to make him chairman of the FCC. He called me, and I talked him into doing it. After he was there a couple of months, he called me. He says, all right, big shot, you talk me into this. I need some ideas. And I... Um, arranged to go from, I was in New York for a board 
meeting of NET that later became PBS, and a young woman named Joan Gans Cooney presented to our board the first beginnings of Sesame Street. And I was knocked out by it. It was so compelling, and she showed us some film of what she was going to do. So I got on the shuttle, went to Washington to meet Dean, and then I would go back the same night to Washington. Dean and I were together, and I told him about the Sesame Street. And he said, what did you say the young woman's name was? I said, her name was Cooney. He said, what'd she look like? I said, well, she's sort of medium-sized. She's got brown hair. She's very attractive. And he said, how old is she? I said, well, she looks like she's in her 40s, I would guess. He said, did the name Gans ever come up? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, she was introduced as Joan Gans Cooney. Cooney must be her married name. Gans maybe is her maiden name. He says, you won't believe what I'm going to tell you. I said, what? He said, that's Joni Gans. I asked her to marry me when we went to the University of Arizona. How do I reach her? So I got them in touch, and <laughs> he said, how can I help you? She said, I've got money, mostly from the Carnegie Foundation, to produce the program, but now I need money to distribute it, and I turned to the federal government, to HEW, they turned me down. And Dean started to laugh. He said, what are you laughing about? He says, well, he said, Barry Goldwater has the budget in the Senate for HEW. You come down to Washington, I'll take you to see Barry. We'll see if he can help you. So he took Joan to Barry Goldwater's office, and Barry Goldwater's looking through the papers, and he said, Joan Gans Cooney, Gans. He said, are you from Arizona? And Joan said, yes, I'm from Phoenix. He said, are you related to Harry Gans? And Joan said, that's my uncle. And Barry Goldwater got up from his chair, threw his arms around her and kissed her and said, you don't believe this, but Harry Gans was my first contributor when I first ran for office. What can I do for you? Then he called Secretary of HEW, it was Casper Weinberger, and he said, why aren't you helping her? She could brought this great program for little children. We need this. Anyway, she walked out of HEW with a million dollars, which enabled her to distribute it, and the rest is history. So for those of you who don't know, Barry Goldwater, of all people, conservative Republican, is the father of Big Bird.